Hello everyone. Welcome to this Agile and Scrum full course by Simply Learn. In this session, we will tell you everything you need to know to become well versed in the concepts of Scrum and Agile in less than 4 hours. Our instructors Chandra, Rahul and Ishan will be covering topics like Agile, Scrum, Agile project management, Agile user stories, scaled Agile framework, how Agile, Waterfall, Scrum and Kanban are different from one another and many more we will also be guiding you on how you can become a scrum master we will be learning all of this in under 4 hours so without any further ado let's get started but before we begin make sure you have subscribed to our youtube channel and don't forget to click on the bell icon so you never miss an update from simply learn welcome to agile tutorial from simply learn i am cmr Chandra Amar a professional consultant and coach certified agile scrum master pmp principal practitioner itl4 managing professional covid 5 and devops as part of this video tutorial we are going to understand what is agile the basic details one should know about agile to understand this better let us uh, look at a time in the late 90s what was happening with software development firms so they used to follow waterfall methodologies so there used to be expression like sir you have a problem so what happened so our client want a new feature to the software we are already midway creating the software we can't add the feature so what does it mean so there is a scenario where the change is asked so why change change may be because of adding certain features removing certain features modifying certain things already given what is wrong in that why can't we do that change so now point here is not about doing the change itself it's about the effort additionally it takes cost money in terms of which is going out the effort then uh, the scope which is going to change at the same time you also need to put more efforts which will delay the project so now is it okay so 90s it was okay today is it okay a big question mark so why is that not okay so we need to understand that very clearly right i knew we should not have used the waterfall methodology for development so is that an issue with the waterfall methodology so answer is no if it is today scenario answer would be yes if it is 90s answer would be no so what changed in this 20 years or 15 years the dynamics of the market changed the behavior of consumers changed So if you look at anyone who is using any product it may be a software product or a hardware uh, like if you have a mobile phone or a television or any application mobile application or application used on your systems the upgradation of the new features and functionality of that is improved more and more and consumer wants it more and you have a very less time to respond that is one thing second thing there is lot of competition if you do not respond quickly competition will take over so for you to sustain and grow it is very essential that you understand this dynamics and you need to respond quickly which was bit difficult when it comes to approach what is called waterfall model now how do we address this so what is that waterfall model is all about why is it difficult for us so the methodology where waterfall model is used involves teams following a series of steps and only going forward after the previous steps are completed so there is a wait time involved so until the previous steps are completed only then i can move to the next so it is a slower thing it would take certain longer duration so it is best used in the scenarios where the teams are small and the project is expected to move in a predictable manner so predictability is very important when we follow waterfall methodology predictability the variation should be as lesser as possible so what is that predictability i'm speaking about as i create this product as a results comes up if it takes 6 months 1 year 2 years 3 years it's okay so this is how the product would look like the predictability how the product would look like how that particular output would come so when is that going to come is it okay if i bring that result after 2 years is that okay so if everything is okay that way without very less without any variations as such very less variations then it's fine so because of following waterfall model uh, what is that methodology what is that flow we need to understand that so requirements gathering and documentation is the first thing what used to happen which is true in agile methodologies also 
But the main difference here is the requirements gathering and documentation happens in detail, a comprehensive one. Now once that is signed off, only then it is moved to the design. Now based on that requirement which is gathered, which is full, comprehensive, then the design will happen based on that. The consideration of process, the products, the people, the environment, then the design happens, which is again a detailed design. Now once the implementation starts, if you find any deviations, the correction needs to be done. Since the design is in detail, the deviation possibility is as less as possible. But the challenge comes up when the dynamics in the market, when the dynamics of customer changes. Customer asks for change, then you may require to do the change. Now when you want to do the change, you may require to do the change only after understanding what would be the impact of this change in the entire output which you are going to create, which is very comprehensive one. So because of this, it consumes time, it consumes extra effort. So it may be a scenario where the scope of work is reduced as well. Even after that, this exercise has to be done, which will delay the project. So this was okay. So when this model, when uh, uh, things were done, things were taken up for changes, it was okay because the consumer behavior, as I mentioned, there is a lot of wait time for the consumers also. So there was less competition, but today it is not. I need to go quicker. So because of this, what are the disadvantages which has came up? to the consumers or to the organization who actually follow waterfall methodologies in today's scenario. So what could be those? So making changes would be difficult as I mentioned uh, earlier. So then it doesn't focus on end user client, customer perspective value. So today I think more and more we're speaking about creating a value in the consumer perspective, customer perspective. And the time it takes for consumer to realize the value, how long it takes, the more it delays in realizing the values by the consumer, there is a delay in terms of making your product impression better in the consumer's mind. So competition would take over. So your existence will be in bigger threat. So testing phase is delayed until most of the project is completed because it has to follow step by step, wait the things to complete and then testing happen. Then measuring the progress within the stages is difficult. So why is it difficult measuring the progress within the stages? Because the deliverables or the metrics what are defined are defined to measure at a milestone and at a end of the phase to understand whether everything is delivered as part of it. Now let us look at how Agile is going to help us to address these disadvantages mentioned in what fall model. So what is Agile? The basic meaning of Agile is to move faster, be flexible, respond to change, etc. But to accomplish this, there are a lot of methodologies. Now, there is something called Agile Manifesto and 12 Principles of Agile, which we need to understand. So following this, accomplishing this can only help us in becoming Agile. So in 2001, Agile was introduced. So that's where the term Agile came into picture, where people start realizing what is Agile and why should we adopt that Agile methodologies. So while it was introduced, so Agile Manifesto was also released. It's a set of principles used in project management and software development. So basically there are four points which we need to understand very correctly, very clearly so that we can able to understand what is agile is all about, right? It enables team to deliver value to their customers with ease. So agile team deliver work in small but usable increments. Then evaluation of the requirements, plans and results takes place continuously. This allows teams to respond to changes quickly. Now change was one of the scenario what we were speaking about. Now responding to change quickly is one of the disadvantages what we spoke about and here it is addressed. It is considered to address, that is very important. Now when we respond to change quickly, it is not that I just quickly responded but I did not address that problem or that scenario. It is very essential to address that scenario as well effectively and efficiently. So now agile is a concept, right? So it has a detailed manifesto based on which all the Agile methodologies are created. So what is this Agile Manifesto is all about? So it is created, it was created during February 2001, so which details out the values and principles of Agile processes, which says there are some values which is mentioned in the left, which has more weightage compared to the one which is in the right. Now when we say this, for example, let us take, let us go one by one, individuals and interactions over process and tools. So are we saying we don't value the process and tools? That is not the case. Now let us look at what were the typical uh, uh, issues or challenges anyone would have expressed regarding the processes. 
so delay may be bureaucracy and uh, they cannot have a flexibility to move faster so basically delays because of uh, the approval which is not happening because of the processes now how do we address this so can i eliminate the process itself answer is no because in the absence of tools and processes none of the uh, things which we can do easily can exist so it should be there process and tool should be there the way it should be defined it should also ensure there is individuals and interactions encouraged to have that individuals and interactions while having the process and tools so next is working products or comprehensive documentation so when we say comprehensive documentation as i mentioned in the waterfall methodology during the requirement gathering during designing there is a detailed documentation which is made so which take lot of efforts in creating those now while delivering the challenge what anyone was faced was the change which is coming up and making changes to these documentations which is an additional effort now if we have a working products if i have a bigger product in that a module of that i keep creating every uh, small small modules of it and start integrating to the base model now i will only focus on that documentation for that particular model working piece which i am going to create in the next iterations then my documentation changes are less and also the way i am making the documentation is initially i would have a full skeleton of the entire product which i am going to create the road map and upon that i am going to making the detailed documentation for that only for that working piece rather than the full product itself then these working piece documentation which i am going to create as i create the working pieces i am also getting the feedback because i am doing the interactions with the users the consumers the end users so i get the feedback i keep making the changes quickly and then documentation will become accordingly the small pieces of documentation which happens with those small 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 working modules which are created and those are consolidated over a period of time by the time the product ends you have a comprehensive documentation the project ends you have a comprehensive documentation so it uh, saves lot of time so documentation is important but the way we accomplish the documentation is one by one not in one go next is customer collaboration or contract negotiation so any engagement or any relationship or any business can it happen in the absence of contract answer is no there should be a contract now how this contract should be when we want to follow an agile it should allow the customer collaboration why are we collaborating to understand what customer is required to understand what customer needs is fulfilled right so now this requires a lot of flexibility in the contract itself so that commercial is one area which gets impacted and there should be guidelines for that also in the contract so that during the collaboration during the change during the effort being put customer is also informed what is the change which is going to happen in terms of commercial as well as time and everything so that it is documented in the contract so there is no confusion responding to change or following a plan now we cannot have a rigid plan as we were speaking about waterfall methodology so that we need to go like this only so based on the scenarios changes so we may require to change your directions and move faster so responding to change requires a specific flexibility which is required in the plan so that you i don't have a plan which is very rigid and that provides some flexibility that's how i can able to create my plan so that i can able to move or respond to that specific scenarios which are changing so this is called agile manifesto and this agile manifesto has 12 principles associated with this now keeping this agile manifesto on 12 principles all the agile methodologies have created their own approaches and framework now let us look at what are those 12 principles the agile principles so agile principles so here are some of principles that need to be followed to make a processes agile so first principle is about customer satisfaction so one need to satisfy the customer through early and quick delivery of the product now someone who is hungry if you give them a water or a food immediately a piece of bread at least there is some satisfaction there is some realization as yes, i got it what i need so energy is back so it is very much required to ensure seeing things in a customer perspective and customer is satisfied so customer satisfaction is not a result of the survey what i do it's about how i deal with the consumer what is that impact the perceptions i'm building with the consumer and what do i know about my customer do i really understand the pulse of my customer how associated am i how close am i how am i collaborating with a customer that will help you to understand how satisfied your customer is it is very essential to consider customer satisfaction and the second principle would be welcome change so changing needs need to be addressed 
even late in the development process. So change can happen any time. Now these changes should not become a challenge. So there should be a flexibility in your design itself which will bring in. So that is the reason I think when you move faster, so it doesn't mean that you eliminate or you uh, just keep introducing the defects and move faster. No, that is not allowed. So whenever there is a change in the feature, whenever there is a change to some uh, specific product functionality, accommodating that should become easier. Whatever the methodology I follow, that should help me in terms of accommodating. So I should be welcoming changes. It's okay for me to have the change. So that is not a challenge anymore for me. So principle three, deliver frequently. So ensure software is delivered frequently, focusing on shorter time scales. As I was mentioning while discussing the manifesto point, like I keep creating a smaller piece of product modules so that I keep putting into the base model and integrating those. And ultimately, once all the features functionalities are integrated, we have a product with all the features and functionalities. So this needs to happen more frequently. So the release of those working piece should happen more frequently, more repeatedly, so that customer is seeing those working piece and experiencing and giving their feedbacks. So quick changes to those working piece, making that will become easier. Then work together. So when I say work together, it is very essential that developers and business individuals need to work together through the course of project, which means involvement of customers, involvement of suppliers, involvement of your own team. Everyone should work together. Each one should understand each other's perspective view. If there is no proper understanding about each other's perspective view, it is quite obvious what was expected what was delivered would not match so there should be correct understanding to have that correct understanding one should work together collaborate so they should speak express it is very important so feedback has to be given by consumers regularly similarly the organization who is doing the project should also keep giving the feedbacks to the suppliers to make necessary changes and once it works together in a unison i think that would help in terms of bringing out the results the way it is required that would help customer to get the value motivated team so projects need to build around motivated individuals and they must be trusted to get the job done means when will the team get motivated when the work what they are doing uh, is acknowledged when the work what they are doing the results are seen experienced and then feedback is given there is an opportunity for learning and contribution their contribution is acknowledged only then team is motivated when there is a motivated team, when team feels there is someone with whom they can look up to, it is quite obvious, team will also come up with certain uh, set of innovation in their mind, giving their feedback as well, involving themselves in terms of getting the results what is required. So it is always essential to ensure the team which is involved in creating the products is always motivated. So I think when we say team, the conflict also come across. There may be a clash between uh, various different thoughts and preferences. So one cannot just shy away being a manager, one cannot shy away from it. He or she should involve, sit with the team, resolve those, put things in the right direction. So right lead, interpersonal skills are very important here. Next, face-to-face -face interactions. So which helps in terms of most efficient means of communication, which helps in terms of giving a proper clarity in terms of what is required. So that I sent an email, I expect the person to do it. That is not the case what we're discussing about. So more and more interactions which should happen face to face so that each other understand what requires to be done. And there is a quick feedback which can happen when that particular interactions conversation which keeps happening. So one can understand other perspective view as well. Then working software. So it is a primarily the deliverable which you're speaking about which has to come regularly. So more and more working piece as it comes. Customer can give feedback based on their experience on this working piece. Instead of just imagining something and then giving the feedback. So it should not look like an hypothesis or something which is in the dreamland. So I told something, the person who heard uh, visualize something else, it should not end up that way. Instead of that, give the working piece, expect the consumer, the user to give the feedback. So that it helps in terms of creating uh, that particular product ultimately which is usable and which is going to create value to the consumers. So next is constant pace. So agile process promotes sustainable development. So it should not, I did it and I sleep. I did it and then I'm waiting for something else. No, there should be frequent deliverables which is happening. So there should be constant movement from left to right, from beginning to end, so that the deliverables which are expected keeps happening so that consumers or users are realizing the value of it. 
So it should be constant pace, the velocity, the speed which needs to be adopted. Then good design, agility can be improved by focusing on technical excellence and good design. So when we say technical excellence and good design, it is very essential to understand insight towards what is that product being delivered, insight towards what is the technology being used, insight towards the processes, the capabilities, skills. So when all this comes together when people sit together and focus on creating that product or services. So they are putting the effort towards designing it appropriately so that that will fit for purpose. So since things are moved step by step in terms of creating a working piece, the detailed designing of that small working piece would happen which can happen quicker as well. And since these are going and fitting into the architecture which is basically open architecture kind of scenarios what we are speaking about. So all those modules what you create you keep plugging into it. So that you are designing that small piece which quicker. So instead of designing the entire system as a whole in detail, you are just creating that small small pieces and fitting into that architecture which is open. So pluggable. So that gives flexibility as well and changes to the design will become easier if it's not working. And the agility helps in accomplishing that. Simplicity. The amount of work that's not being done needs to be minimized. Meaning when we say simplicity doesn't mean less. Right. So the appropriate number of tasks, the minimum number of tasks which needs to be done and mostly I think all non-value adding activities and processes would be removed. It has to be removed. So the more optimized, more simpler in terms of handling things is always good. So that only those what is required to be done are done. So it is very clearly visible and there will be clarity. Self-organization. So when we say self-organized teams who is not capable of everything, but when you look at a team as a whole, each one has different different skills, many skills, not one or two skills, many skills which they are complementing to each other. So they come together, they discuss together, they focus on the architectures, requirements and design and address it together. So team is also owning. The ownership is one thing when it comes to picture when we say team. So here since team is actually taking up that ownership and organizing themselves to accomplish the results, the products, what is required. So then obviously the results will happen the way it is needed and they will become accountable as a team. So they cannot have a blaming scenario where because of one or two members it is happening. They should collaborate better. They should be self-organizing what should happen. So next is uh, reflect and adjust. So when are we going to reflect? Reflect upon what is that happening. Learn, understand, keep learning it. Having a reflection to that what is happening means responding to that so that improvement can happen quicker. Effectiveness can be improved by the team regularly reflecting on it. So team is also understanding, team is also having that accountability to ensure that necessary adjustments, necessary actions are taken to make those changes and corrections quickly. So these are about 12 principles. So which supports, which helps that accomplishment of manifesto points, the four manifesto points what is mentioned. So keeping these four manifesto points, four values which is mentioned in manifesto and then 12 principles. So keeping these in mind, any agile methodologies have their own approaches and they accomplish all of this. So further let us look at some of the uh, advantages what would be there when following agile. So we looked at the disadvantages what we have when we follow waterfall. So did we overcome those? The disadvantages what we had in uh, waterfall, did we overcome that using agile? So what are the advantages of Agile? So Agile is uh, helpful in terms of handling large amounts of interactions between client and project team because it is throwing lights on it. So the importance of interactions, the importance of collaboration, the uh, what is that self-organized teams, it is spoken more and more. Then improve transparency to clients in every phase of the project. How this transparency? Because customer is seeing those products. The products with features and functionalities are seen. They are experiencing it and based on that they are given the feedback. There is nothing something hidden like when I go with waterfall till the end of the project customer don't know what is going to come out as a whole. But here since the working piece is given regularly customer is seeing it. The users are using it and giving their feedback. So interactions increased. So visibility towards what we are creating a results is more. Right. Then the delivery of the output is predictable and can sometimes be earlier than expected because we know what is being delivered. More and more clarity users are obtaining. At the same time the team which is creating is obtaining. Because of it the pulse of the customer, the directions are clear. Accommodating changes which was a challenges in, it was a big challenge in waterfall methodology has become easier here. So then the cost of the project are predictable 
and follow a rigid schedule. So it is very easy to handle the schedules because more and more you interact and more iterations or in uh, so creation of small small working piece of a product, working module of the product. So now as you progress in that, you understood the environment better, you understood the clients better, the customers better, the expectation better and moving faster. So that will become easier for you. Now you have become predictable. You can predict easily what is that going to happen ultimately. So more and more visibility you start getting. So handling things will become easier. So then it allows for changes to refine and reprioritize the product backlog. So when I say product backlog, we need to understand the various different user stories what is written to deliver. So that is a list of deliverables, product backlog, what are there. Since we already know what are the things needs to be created. So this helps in terms of prioritizing those, changing the priorities based on the change scenario and then taking the pace, taking the speed accordingly. The client can provide the priority of features allowing the team to ensure maximum project value. So since it is visible, what are the user stories, what are the epics written, what is that order, priorities, order of priority what we have kept. Now the change scenario obviously tells us do we really need to change this, priority of which feature has to be done first. So that will become easier because you have the list only changing that order in the list and then going forward accordingly. Integration is not an issue because we have the base model which can integrate all of this together with no issues. Now then by focusing on needs of the users, the team can deliver value to the customers. So users are involved more often. So user pulse is understood, what user requires is clearly understood. So delivering that value to the customer will become more easier and simpler. So then project is broken into smaller units with high quality development testing and collaboration because you have that flexibility. So since you have better visibility, you can able to do this and you move one by one, iteration by iterations, you progress further. So those were the advantages of uh, adopting Agile. Now keeping that Agile manifesto and 12 principles of manifesto. So what are the types of typical Agile methodologies we would come across? So there are few which we are going to look at as part of it which we need to know. So these Agile methodologies definitely considers the Agile manifesto points and then they demonstrate it in their own way. Now Agile methodologies perspective, let us go one by one. So some of them to look at, the first one is XP that is extreme programming. So this is the framework that enables teams to create high quality software and improves their quality of life. So it enables software development with appropriate engineering practices. So and then when is it applicable? So it is applicable to the scenario where changing software requirements to handle risks caused due to new technology while working with a small extended development team to use technology to allow automated unit and functional tests. So that is about extreme programming. So next let us look at Kanban. So Kanban is the methodology which is used to design, manage and improve the flow of system. It is actually called as pull system, so visual system. So everything which is actually put on a board and it is visible to everyone, what work need to be done, what is in progress, who has to do, it is very clearly visible. So organizations can visualize their flow of work and the limiting their work in progress. So what is limiting, what is stopping is clearly visible. So generally if I look at whenever, I'll just take a scenario of uh, a meeting and minutes of meeting which always discuss about it. Now when there is a minutes of meeting shared with uh, many people who have participated in the meeting, there are certain action items given to them, for example. Now these action items have, will have a target date to complete and accordingly those needs to be closed. Now when the next meeting happens, when you look at that action item status, majority of them are not addressed. What could be the reason? Is that people are not sensitive about answering or addressing those? So more than that, the prioritization changes. So one important thing we need to understand how Kanban works here is, it is a visual system compared to that minutes of meeting which is not visible to us always. The Kanban board is visible to us always. So one which is visible to us always makes us put a conscious effort to close it because our name is indicated on the board the work need to be completed is mentioned against our name, then we need to take it up and then close it. So it pushes it. it. We will put a conscious effort because it is visible and I cannot build any stories telling that why I did not do, why did I not consider this as a priority rather than consider something else as a priority. So this Kanban straight up addresses it. 
and then it's also called as pull system because people pull the work from it and then complete right so where is this applicable it can be used in situations where work arrives in an unpredictable fashion so that means it gives a lot of flexibility in terms of adopting to the changes which are happening the dynamics environment so it is also used to deploy work immediately without waiting for other work items so since it is visible i think things can go smoother easier so that people are owning it rather than just disowning it so now let us look at lean so when we say lean it is very important for us to understand that value is always in customer perspective and elimination of waste these are the two things mainly spoken about so lean is a set of tools and principles that aims to identify and remove waste to increase the speed of process development it focuses on maximizing the value to the client ensuring waste is minimized so when you look at visualize a processes process interfaces and the flow so the interface certain way so unless the output of one process or procedures getting into an another process so that flow should be smoother like many pipes connected together and water is flowing so let us assume a series of pipes which is of around uh, one feet in terms of diameter of each of the pipes water is flowing in between if you have a pipe which is of half a feet now what happens to the downstream after that uh, half feet pipe the entire capacity in the downstream even though it has one feet diameter pipe it leads to the waste underutilized capacity because this has become bottleneck now such bottlenecks such the one which contributes to the waste has to be eliminated that is very important so value should be seen in the consumer perspective and that value would happen only through the series value streams then in this value stream the identification of the constraints and bottlenecks and elimination of waste now what are the contributors of waste so waiting time more often changing things moving from one place to another place allowing defects to flow which leads towards a rework so all this likewise many things which actually end up in giving the waste so one has to visualize understand realize what are those non valuing activities and eliminating those is very important right so now when is it applicable lean principles apply to any sector where there is waste of any form so it can be applied easily so one is to know that so that it should be effort which needs to be put with the objective to accomplish so your ability to move faster your ability to create that uh, product which is more efficient so only you can achieve it the effective results can happen only when there is a lesser delays or lesser waste non valuing activities that needs to be understood and eliminate those so next one of the popular methodology would be scrum so scrum is a framework that is used by teams to establish a hypothesis trying it out reflect on the experience and adjust it is used to enable teams to incorporate practices from other frameworks depending on the team's requirement it's a simple framework which speaks about a product owner a scrum master a self organizing team so some of the terminologies what it uses is a sprint daily scrum product backlog sprint backlog so it's very essential to understand this framework simpler and able to adopt it is below is also very easy when is it applicable it is used when cross functional teams are working on product development when work is split into more than one two to four week iterations so these iterations are called as sprints small time boxed iterations so this will also help in terms of accomplishing the results provides that flexibility and able to move faster then crystal so crystal is an approach to the software uh, development that focuses on people and their interactions rather than tools and processes it is aimed to streamline processes and improve optimization it works on principle that projects are unique and dynamic each requiring its specific methods so where is it applicable it focuses on strengthening teams communication it also focuses on continuous integration active user involvement and configurable processes so these are the few agile methodologies which are there which are more popular more heard however we can come across many other methodologies like safe agile which is a scaled scenario for more complex projects so likewise we have many methodologies uh, which organizations adopt and these are few for us to understand 
As part of this tutorial, we are going to understand the basic understanding requirements of Scrum, the Agile methodology. So let us look at the problem scenario. What was there in the absence of adoption of Agile in any given environment? So in the given scenario, there is a problem expressed. So we have a problem. Our consumer doesn't like our product. We will have to make changes immediately. So now as usual, any manager would respond. The manager says, make the changes. So because it's always uh, the changes or anything what we deliver is in the consumer's interest. So keeping consumer's interest in mind, the value which needs to be created for customers, any changes required to be done in any of our projects, involving that consumers and customer, we may require to do the change. So but what is the problem here to do the change? So we can't. We already have started work on last batch. The waterfall model we follow doesn't let changes to be made midway through the process. So is it mean the waterfall model never allows the changes to happen? That is not true 100%. Waterfall model allows us to make changes, but it doesn't allows us to make the changes quickly. So whenever there is a change, it requires a lot of effort. It requires changes in documentation. It asks for the changes in uh, various different uh, implementations which has already done, which is executed already. And then a lot of efforts are involved, which is time consuming. And also it involves more cost. Now, how do we make the change which is required to the customer? And at the same time, we don't have any specific additional effort which are required. So these efforts, whatever is being put is acceptable to both the parties, both the stakeholders, that is the project organization as well as the customer. So how do we make it happen quickly as well? That is very important for us. So we should have used the agile methodologies. So meaning agile methodology helps us to do this. So one of the agile methodologies which we are going to look at as part of this tutorial is Scrum. So let us see how Scrum is going to help the scenario. So scenario of changes which are coming up more frequently, right? Right, before that, let us understand what is the meaning of Agile. What is the meaning of Agile? Uh, what it means and why should we adopt Agile? So Agile means moving faster, being flexible, responding to the changes. Now Agile is a set of methods and practices that focuses on iterative development. Why iterative? In each iterations, Agile methodologies helps us to create a working piece of the software product which will help us to make quick corrections to those software piece. This is not a whole product. It is part of that bigger product. So requirements and solutions are obtained thanks to self-organizing cross-functional teams collaborating. So when we say cross-functional team, self-organizing team, so these are the teams which are 7 plus or minus 2, the size of the team what I am speaking about who basically have various different skills. Each of the team members will have various different skills and they complement to it. I think today the DevOps is speaking about this cross-functional team owning everything as a single team. Some of the organizations has already demonstrated their DevOps capabilities by having this approach. Like having self-organizing and cross-functional team, having an accountability for the entire product, the particular piece of the product module what they have created. So this helps in improving accountability and also ensures better visibility of the product what is being created and delivered. So further let us look at the advantages of using Agile. So what it gives to us, how it helps. So now the organization who follows the Agile methodologies, so we can see that projects follow a predefined schedule and have a predictable cost. So schedules are seen, but Wherever there is a changes required, wherever there is a directions need to be changed in terms of making necessary changes to adopt to the required scenario, the change scenario, Agile helps us. It, it gives that flexibility. So clients have visibility of each phase of project. So it is very essential whosoever adopts the Agile methodology, the active involvement of customer has to be ensured. So they are actively involved. So customers or clients actively involved in the sense they know it what is happening, what they are getting, they know. They are acknowledging it by giving the feedbacks every now and then so that there is no surprise to them at the end, which used to happen during waterfall approaches. Then greater interaction between project team and the project. 
means there needs to be collaboration. Agile emphasizes on having the collaboration. So Scrum in specific have something called uh, daily uh, Scrum where 15 minutes meeting where entire uh, Scrum team should come in, sit together, uh, self-organizing team as well as all that uh, Agile team has to come together, express what they have completed before the last uh, daily Scrum meeting and what is pending, why is it pending and what is that they are going to do before the next meeting. So all these are expressed. This will help the team as well as the scrum master as well as the product owner the visibility into what is complete what needs to be completed and this will help a project manager or scrum master to provide the necessary inputs better visibility to the customers and stakeholders as well product output is predictable and can sometimes happen earlier than expected so now initially as we know so the visibility of anything what we do will be very less so now as we discuss more and more, as we brainstorm more and more, the visibility into it will become more. Then what would happen in future, the ability to predict will also become easier. And it, this doesn't happen only with the project team. It also happens with customers and every stakeholders who are involved in the project. So next, high quality development, testing and collaboration is ensured since the project is broken down. So now each iterations, each uh, module, each piece of uh, software which is being created are tested regularly and feedbacks are obtained from the user as well. Active involvement of user are ensured so that they are acknowledging it. So the what customer needs are given. So it is not that I discover something uh, which I did not need. I am seeing it. I told something, I am getting something. That scenario is eliminated. Then the product backlog can be refined and reprioritized. So since we move uh, iteration wise, depending on the change scenario, depending on the directions changes, we can keep reordering or reprioritizing our product backlog. What needs to be created first? If I have uh, one, two, three, four, five item, I can make it as three, four, one, two, five. So depending on the change scenario, whenever it needs to be executed, it is a bit flexible and easy to do. Then teams can maximize project value since clients can provide project priority. So as we know the visibility also increases to the consumer as well as all the stakeholders. They will also express what is that value they have seen from this and this will also help in making a decision should we continue with this project or should we not. So better visibility, better decision making, better value realization. The needs of the customer can be focused on increasing the value delivered. So as customer gives the feedback, as that visibility increases, then a customer is getting that value and then expressing what is that changes, what is that additionally they may require here, how can we make it better. So these interactions can happen. So customer can be focused on increasing the value delivery. So in fact, I think earlier we used to speak about time to market. Today we are speaking about time to value, which means how quickly uh, the consumers, the users or customers realizes the value. Is that benefit realized? So that's what uh, the more and more discussion which is happening, which requires closer collaboration with consumers and their feedbacks, their experiences with the products or services which are being used by them. It is very essential to understand. So then various different methodologies what we have in Agile. We can speak about Scrum, Kanban, Extreme Programming, that is XP, Lean Methodologies, the Crystal. So now in this video tutorial, we are actually focusing on Scrum. So let us understand what is this scrum is all about, right? So before we go and understand what is the scrum itself, so let us look at the history of scrum, where it started, how it started. So right down the line uh, during 1986, the name scrum is first introduced by the management experts, Yukujiro Nonaka and Hirotaka Takuchi. So Japanese. So now this terminology was introduced, but later in 1995, Jeff uh, Sutherland and Ken Schubert creates the early version of what would become the Agile methodologies. So now earlier 1995, so need for Agile was sensed and it was spoken about. I mean, why do we need Agile methodologies in future? What would be the future organization which would look like? So that would trigger in terms of what kind of approaches we may require to have. So further 2001, the Agile Alliance is founded. And first look on Scrum, the Agile software development with Scrum is published. 
So then further uh, down the line, 2002, the Scrum Alliance is founded by Weber and certifications are added. Then uh, later 2006, the Scrum Inc. is created. The certified Scrum courses are taught. So people started getting certified on uh, Scrum. Then later 2009, Scrum.org is created, which offers the professionals Scrum series of certifications. Then 2010, the first Scrum Guide is published, so which made available to everyone. So from then, I think uh, the more and more people start adopting Scrum methodologies. Now, interesting part is the journey started from uh, 1980s till 2010, various changes which has happened to this particular methodology. But one thing we should keep in mind is, same 20 years back or 15, 20 years back, if we go, the need for Agile was not seen. So it was spoken, but need for Agile was not spoken much. But today we are speaking about it more and more. The reason is, I think, the change in the market condition, the increase in the competition, the need of responding to the change which is asked by the consumers or the market variations has become more and more important for organizations and service providers. If they don't respond to the change, they may lose out in the competition. So their survival is at stake. So it, it is very essential for them to understand these dynamics and respond to those scenarios quickly. So that's where the adoption of Agile, the benefit of adopting Agile were realized and Scrum become popular. So what is Scrum? So let us look at that. So now Scrum is a framework that enables teams to work together. Means collaboration is very important while we become agile. So with Scrum team, one can look, I mean, see and experience. So learning from experiences happens. So those are captured. Self-organize working on problems. So they work together. They discuss, brainstorm, reflect on their victories. Means any achievements has to be celebrated, acknowledged, quick wins, recognized, and their losses to improve. So wherever the things doesn't go good, necessary corrections has to be done. I think Scrum approach would help in terms of uh, doing it quicker, better. Then some of the benefits using Scrum would look like Steam can provide project deliverables and in an efficient manner. So in time, eh, we are completing all the features and functionality. So the, the entire model, the methodology, what is there, which helps in accomplishing those. Then further, time and money are used efficiently. So time is very important. Giving results in a mentioned schedule is very important. Ensuring results are coming up effectively is important, efficiently, the performance of that products. Now, since we are creating those small piece, working piece in every iterations, so that experience of using that would also be there and quick feedbacks will come back so that time and money is saved. And we are doing in time. So projects are divided into smaller units called sprint so the iterations what i was speaking about the quick iterations of activities which happens uh, during the adoption of scrum when organization adopt the scrum methodology so it is called a sprint it's a time box iterations which will have a set of subset of uh, product backlog taken as a sprint backlog and those users stories and epics are delivered as part of that uh, sprint and then uh, those are reviewed on a daily basis as part of daily scrum meeting and also we have other meetings which will happen. When we go and look at the Scrum methodology, how this happens, I think we'll get better visibility. Work best for fast moving projects. Now, whenever we need to respond quickly, whenever we want to move faster. Now, remember, when we say moving faster means it doesn't mean that we can allow any defects to happen. We can ignore something. We cannot do that. We need to ensure everything is taken care. At the same time, all those results what are created has to be acknowledged. Right? Confirm. Yes, it is defect free. So all those which is supposed to be addressed are taken care and things are moving faster and better and the results are according to what was actually expressed as a requirement. It is fulfilling those. Then scrum meetings provide the team great visibility. Since there is a daily scrum meeting which keeps happening, people speaks about what they have done from the previous uh, daily scrum, what is that they have accepted, they will complete and what is complete. Is everything is complete or something is pending? If it is pending, why is that pending? And what is that you are going to do further before the next daily scrum meeting? So these are discussed, understood. So that there's a quick 15 minutes meeting which gives the insight. 
and further wherever there is a dependency deviations which occurs further maybe scrum master sit with them separately in a, uh, to understand that in detail so daily scrum meetings give the quick insights so that it increases the visibility what is happening on ground constantly involves feedback from clients and customers as i mentioned earlier while discussing about agile active involvement of a customer is very essential so customer should give the feedbacks whenever that working piece of the application or a product is given so only then uh, whether the product or that module what is created is uh, having that features and functionality which helps him providing necessary requirement fulfillment is that happening or not then making changes based on feedback are very easy because everyone is informed and they are aware of what is being changed and what needs to be changed then individual efforts of the team members are given focus yes individual efforts is essential at the same time each team member cross skills we call it a self organizing team as i was mentioning earlier so each team member will have a different different skills different different capabilities and also cross skilling within the team is encouraged so that the ownership on individuals uh, deliverables and team as a whole working together to deliver some features functionality can also be accomplished right then scrum team involves product owner scrum master and then scrum team so each of these are different roles having their own objectives to accomplish with the specific directions and each of these cannot be merged like for example the roles and responsibilities of product owner cannot be given to single individual who is a scrum master so both the roles cannot be given a single individual because it conflicts the objectives of both the roles so thinking about putting this one of the team member becoming scrum master or product owner thinking in that angle is also something which is which will not work which will not uh, give the required results so now what are these roles what are the responsibilities where is the focus of each of the roles so let us discuss on that now when it comes to product owner so the product owner is primarily responsible for maximizing the roi by determining the product features prioritizing it into a list what needs to be focused on for the next sprint and constantly reprioritizing and refining it so the key points what we need to see here is so one is determining the product features maximizing the roi the second one and then reprioritizing and refining the product backlog now why is that needs to be done so maximizing roi in the sense obviously product owner should closely work with the business and have an insight towards what is that business require what is that customer require how it helps customer to accomplish that result so that it helps the justifying that investment what they are doing with the products features and functionalities then uh, speaking about reprioritizing and refining it it depends on what features needs to be delivered in what order so there is already an order which is defined so based on the change scenario you can reorder it and product owner has that ownership and responsibility so the entire focus is on ensuring the right product backlog prioritizing it and also adding that user stories and epics into product backlog depending on what makes sense to the business so the scrum master the next role helps teams learn and apply scrum to obtain business value means scrum master closely works with the team so he or she helps remove impediments what is impediments something which stops to move forward something which doesn't allow to deliver things the way it is required something which stops right so that needs to be eliminated that needs to be understood what are the impediments so when we say impediments what are the impediments we can think of the skills and capabilities of the team that is one thing maybe the testing environment maybe a process so many things comes as a bottleneck or impediments which stops things to move smooth or forward so scrum master should work on it identify that and support team or guide team to overcome those so protects them from interfaces that helps the team to adopt agile practices so encouraging team to adopt agile practices and ensuring they demonstrate it and provides the required value as it's move forwards so since scrum master focuses one side in terms of making scrum team to work whereas product owner is looking at the entire product backlog and working more closely with the business so they need to have a good handshake uh, to ensure things go well but these two roles cannot be merged because since it has a two different angles and two different dynamics 
so spending time accomplishing both the things may become very challenging and conflicting and the prioritizing will also be difficult then scrum team is a collection of all the individuals who work together to deliver the requirements of the stakeholders so self organizing team what i was mentioning what we were discussing earlier so these teams comes together each of the team member will have various different capabilities so they contribute at the individual level and as a team has a whole complement or contribute towards ultimate output and outcome and value what they need to create and this team should have a clear understanding about the deliverable what is being done so is that deliverable what features and functionality what they are thinking is that going to create that value ultimately what is need to be achieved the requirements fulfillment which is which needs to be happen to the customers so they need to have that understanding the direction should be clear to the team so there are certain artifacts to look at when it comes to scrum so let us look at that so now we speak about the artifacts which are the components of the scrum process that can improve transparency and understanding of the work so there are three artifacts mainly which we call it as a product backlog sprint backlog then product increment so let us see what is this one by one so when i say product backlog so it consists of list of new features changes to be made to existing features the bug fixes changes to the infrastructure and several other activities that the team needs to deliver to ensure a particular outcome so this list of product backlogs becomes with required features and functionalities what needs to be delivered so the prioritization of this has to happen in what order what needs to be delivered so the product backlog is the full list which needs to be delivered as part of this project and as the project progresses a lot of uh, new backlog item would be added to the product backlog uh, as the dynamics of the particular uh, scenarios keeps changing so keeps adding reprioritizing additional uh, items to the backlogs are added depending on what are those dynamics so further looking at a sprint backlog so sprint refers to that short period of iterations right so uh, which the team aims to get a given amount of work done so it helps teams deliver working software in a frequent manner so sprint could be between 1 to 4 weeks long depending on what is that deliverable is so sprint backlog is a subset of product backlog so that prioritize item what is taken into sprint which is a time boxed iterations the sprint backlog contains the task the team aims to complete to satisfy the sprint goal so what is that sprint goal so each of those iterations the time box iterations will have a specific objective to accomplish so the sprint goal is the objective decided for the sprint as an outcome of negotiation between the product owner and the team so what can be delivered how long it takes to deliver so when it has to be delivered the target may be given by product owner but is it possible feasible to complete it there next there is some negotiation which happens there so they decide they agree yes we can do it we cannot do it if at all we can do it what is that it takes in terms of effort time and cost so everything is decided discussed so that objective of that particular iterations is agreed upon so once it is agreed i think a team should first identify the tasks from the product backlog that need to be delivered to achieve the goal so these tasks are then added to sprint backlog so there should be an agreement between both and once it is added once it is agreed as part of that sprint the deliverable the output of the sprint would be the one which needs to be completed as part of it the objectives the goal the results which is specific working software then product increment so this refers to the combination of all product backlog tasks completed in the sprint and the value of the increment of previous sprints now when we speak about lean lean speaks about elimination of waste it speaks about value streams now in each of the sprints as we have a working software being delivered now each of these piece should keep complementing to the what is the one which is already delivered and what is being delivered in future so keeping that in mind every deliverable will be implemented or configured in such a way that there is no specific bottlenecks there is no specific constraints which arises so this needs to be kept in mind which requires the entire visibility into what is that ultimate objective we are going to accomplish so in this product increment all those combination of the product backlogs task which is being done should keep this in mind team should be very clear about it 
So I in the first sprint I delivered something, in the sprint two I delivered something, but I cannot integrate them. They cannot work together. It will lead into the further issues and then complications. That should not happen. So when we say agile, it's about moving faster, fine. So responding to change, fine, but that should not lead towards further complexity. It should make things simpler, smoother. So Scrum is stressing on that part. So an increment refers to inspectable, usable work done at the end of the sprint. It represents a step towards overall goal or vision of the project, as I was mentioning. Then the outcome should be in usable condition, even if the product owner doesn't decide to release it. So it should be in usable condition. So two things we speak about. So one is uh, release, other one is deployment. Now people usually get confused between release and deployment. So release about this part, what we're speaking about, product is usable. So it is released, product is usable. But only after deployment, user will have an access to use it. So that is the difference. Release makes that product usable. Whereas deployment makes it available to the user to use. So this difference people should know. So release doesn't mean that it is already available for user to use. So this understanding of the difference should also be there so that one can understand what it means by release as well and what it means by deployment. That's why when we speak about DevOps, we keep speaking about uh, CICD. In CICD, we speak about uh, continuous integration continuous uh, delivery and continuous deployment. So in continuous delivery, you're speaking about release basically. So once it is released, it becomes usable. So once it is deployed, it is available for user to use. And that's about the Scrum artifacts. Now let us look at uh, Scrum framework, how that Scrum framework looks like in entirety. So what are the components comes into picture? Already we spoke about the Scrum approach itself, what it is. Now we spoke about understanding artifacts, then we spoke about roles in Scrum, the activities for each of the roles we understood. Now where do we see all of this when we look at a Scrum framework? So that picture let us see. So when we say Scrum framework, already we spoke about the product backlog. We can see that it is in the left side in the beginning. We have a sprint planning, so we spoke about sprint, the time box iterations and uh, from the product backlog the items which is moving towards sprint to a specific sprint what needs to be delivered which become sprint backlog now the backlog items are taken and scrum team work on it and does a daily scrum meeting and once the deliverables of that particular sprint happens then there is a review on it then the increment is delivered and at the same time that retrospective what was planned versus what is delivered that is checked if you look at from sprint review so you have a retrospective to check what is planned versus what is being delivered. At the same time, the review points will come and get updated to product backlog as well to the product owner. So product owner should be aware what is delivered, what is pending to be delivered, and that increment is further delivered. So these increments, what is delivered to production, what is deployed in the production should have values, that integration which happens, both all the increments coming together to provide that fulfillment of the requirement as well as creating that value what is required. So product backlog is the first step of Scrum framework is a set of list of tasks to have successfully achieve the goals of the stakeholders. We discuss that while discussing on product backlog. So further sprint planning happens where the team determines the tasks from the product backlog they will work on and aim to deliver during the sprint. Now this is negotiated understood agreed and then most towards sprint to get delivered then sprint backlog are the tasks discussed during the sprint planning means the previous step and also during the script planning and then added to the sprint backlog once it goes to the sprint backlog as part of the time boxed iteration sprint the deliverables should happen now scrum team the scrum team which is actually self-organizing team as we mentioned maybe five to ten nine members of team working on the task in the sprint backlog and they will also have a daily scrums where the team also discusses for 15 minutes on the events where the team member synchronizes activities and plan what they aim to achieve in next 24 hours what is accomplished against what is discussed in previous daily scrum and then 
if at all any further discussions need to be done in the correction of those that can be taken as a separate meeting not as part of the daily scrum so generally daily scrum meeting would be 15 minutes it should not go more than that it's an indicative time so quicker updates to understand what is happening then uh, the sprint review happens where uh, once the sprint is complete so sprint review happens which involves the team the scrum master and product owner and stakeholders to understand what is being agreed upon and what is being delivered so reviewed is that fulfilled in the entirety that is discussed and then uh, during this meeting the team shows what they accomplished during the sprint it allows time to ask questions make observations give feedback and provide suggestions right then the product owner also presents the product backlogs talk to the stakeholders to get feedback for upcoming sprints and about things related to the backlog now this one sprint is complete for the next sprint what should be the prioritization so the product owner has to sp speak with the stakeholders so that there is a good understanding good handshake that what needs to be delivered and what is the priority in the given list then sprint retrospective happens so after the sprint review uh, sprint retrospective happens so during this meeting what went well like past mistakes potential issues what are the new ways to handle them which are required to be done correctly in the next uh, iterations or next sprints needs to be identified data from found from here are incorporated when planning the new sprint so it works like a lessons learned what went well what did not go well what is that we did for those what did not go well so what is that learning we have in these iterations so how can we ensure that in the upcoming iterations the same mistakes are will not repeat so those can be uh, discussed documented and then consider while moving to the next uh, sprint then the increment is a workable output which is given to the stakeholders so this is where the user actually sees their workable piece working item and then they give necessary feedback as well on the particular uh, application piece or software uh, piece then there is something called scrum board which is used during this flow of scrum right from product backlog to the creation of that increment so let us look at what is a scrum board which is used during the scrum practice so scrum board is a physical or virtual tool that helps team to visualize items in the sprint backlog so it helps in tracking what is being delivered what is in progress and what needs to be delivered further so it shows all action items during the daily scrum helping keeping the team focused on tasks that need to be completion and the priorities of those the scrum board is usually present in a place that's accessible to all team members it is a visual board right and can be physical whiteboard and stickers or virtual software tools which can be used and displayed on the screen so the scrum board is divided into different slots like to do in progress and done so when new sprints are started the existing board is reset and new scrum board is created so since it is visual system i think it is taking the thought from kanban so visual system always works effective because the moment i know i see something is uh, uh, put ag against my name that i need to complete this it's quite obvious to me that i will put efforts to complete it so it's a conscious effort what i will put it works on my consciousness so something which is not visible to me it is not out of sight is out of mind so i will not work on it so i may there is a tendency to forget so if i see it regularly if i have that uh, feeling or that vibes which comes to every individual such so someone is everyone is having a visibility to it something is pending against me so i am answerable that consciously that comes to the mind so and people start working on it and closing of that will happen quickly so everything is visible there is nothing hidden so look at the scenario so when once it is explained i think it's okay even though we messed up this time we will incorporate scrum into our products i am sure we will do a good job next time but keep in mind whenever change comes it doesn't mean that i need to go and do scrum practice never get into that decision understand what is the nature of change what is that speed how quickly you may require to do the change and uh, what is the impact of the change how often this change is may come up you may know this from the lessons learned with the adopted practice and methodologies and then decide is the existing model or existing practice whatever we are doing is it okay 
or should we really need to go and uh, buy, have a buy-in from the Scrum and entirely we organize ourselves to have a Scrum approach. So it is always advisable to go for a Scrum approach whenever there is a dynamics of quickly moving from left to right from product backlog to that increment what needs to be created. So accomplishing that speed and involving the consumers regularly if it is feasible. So consumer and stakeholders may say they cannot involve then you becoming agile will not make sense because they are not even giving the feedbacks. So active involvement of the team, the scrum master, the product owner, the business, the stakeholders, the consumers very very important. If they don't involve so the deliverables cannot happen the way it is required. So active involvement, active collaboration of every stakeholders are essential. There should be collaboration and communication, the effective collaboration and communication which needs to be happening. The product team has taken up a new project called Weathermaster. The team is planning to move to Scrum methodology and this is an outline of its first Scrum meeting. Time box to 15 minutes, Rick is the Scrum Master of this meeting where the team members discuss what they did yesterday, their plans for today, and the impediments they faced. All team members are standing up, including Todd, who's joined the meeting via video chat. Rick holds the meeting near a scrum board. Angela, the product owner, is absent. Rick reiterates that all discussions would be parked until after the scrum meeting and encourages his team to keep the meeting short. People can chime in to resolve obstacles. Hi team, welcome to the daily stand-up meeting for the product team on Project Weathermaster. We are in Sprint 1 and today is the second day. As we are planning to transition to Scrum methodology, I hope you will find this daily stand-up meeting helpful. In this meeting, you will provide information about what you did yesterday, what you plan to do today, and what challenges you faced. I think everyone's here. Let's start. I don't see Angela. Shouldn't she be here? I did add Angela as an optional attendee to this meeting, and since she hasn't showed up, we don't have to wait for her, Susan. Scrum doesn't provide a specific yes or no about the product owner's participation in the daily Scrum. The PO's primary role is to provide direction and clarify requirements and priorities. Since we don't always discuss those in detail at this meeting, the PO is not required to be here. If the POs want to attend, they are generally in listen-only mode for the duration of the meeting. They can use the information gathered during the meeting for separate offline conversations. What about Todd? He works from his home office, right? Todd will be a part of the meeting through video chat. It is important that we include every team member in the meeting. Hi Todd, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. Am I audible? Yes, Todd. Team, let's all stand up for the meeting. Why don't you go first, Aaron? Yesterday I was working on creating the mock objects to mask the database calls from the unit tests. The difficulty with this approach is that our server-side logic is so dependent on the metadata that writing a true mock is a mammoth exercise. There are decisions that are taken during runtime based on the data. Some of the stored procedure calls are also made based on the values returned through inline queries that are also embedded in the code. 
I was debugging the code until about 9 p.m., but for the life of me, I couldn't figure this out. Aaron, could we request you to be concise when you provide an update? If you think some of the details you describe might be interesting to others, why don't you write a wiki page on it and share the link? So, getting back to your update, did you finish the task yesterday? No, it turned out to be much more complex than I had imagined. I'll continue to work on it today and see if I can figure out an XML structure to mock the schema and hard code some return values. But I am really stuck as far as the inline queries are concerned. I know what you're talking about. There is a reason why the inline queries are there in the code. This is mainly for performance reasons when the overheads of making a procedure call based on a metadata value and then processing the... Sorry for the interruption again, guys. This is a really great conversation. May I suggest we write this issue in the parking lot? I'm not sure what you mean by that, Rick. Let me explain. What Aaron just brought up is a blocking issue. Team members should bring these up during the daily scrum so that everybody knows that one of the team members is stuck. However, the daily scrum is not necessarily the meeting where solutions to every obstacle can or should be found. It looks like Mary knows a thing or two about the issue that Aaron has brought up. Let's jot this down as a parking lot topic. This means the team can have offline conversations after the daily scrum to track it down. I'm also going to make a note that will track the impediment Aaron faced daily until it is removed. You should let me know if I can help in any way, right? Aaron, is there anything else you would like to say? No, I am done. Thanks. Yesterday, I worked on developing the wizards for bulk order creation. I'm almost done. Today, I need to write code to handle some of the exception scenarios before I can get them over to Susan for testing. That's it for me, I guess. Did you forget to mention any impediments? Not really an impediment at present, but I would like to mention that my computer probably needs to be upgraded with more RAM. It has been slow for the past few weeks. Okay, I wrote up some scenarios to test the bulk order wizard. I'm looking to get my hands on the code as soon as Mary is done. Today, I'm also hoping to complete the company order testing that has been pending for a while. I'm okay for the moment, but I do have one question. Shouldn't we all be updating the task board as we speak? We could. It is up to you guys if you think you want to do this during the meeting. If you ask my opinion, we should update the board as soon as we are ready to move the tasks and not wait for the meeting. This will ensure that the board is always up to date and also that we use the meeting time to focus on the conversations. That's a great point, Rick. I can't see the board very well from here anyway, so maybe we should find a way to create an electronic version of it too at some point. Great point, Todd. Why don't you go next with your updates? All right. Hey, Rick, would you like to know about my work on the advertising module first or the integration server? Whatever the team decides is fine with me. Remember, this is really your meeting, and I'm only here to facilitate and ensure we get the most out of this meeting. All right then, I guess I'll start with the integration server. I would like to inform everybody that I managed to set up the integration server that we can use as a sandbox to test the code before checking it in source control. I'll send everybody a link with some instructions and credentials. I have also started looking at the stories for the advertising module. It looks like there are a lot of open statements in the stories that I don't really understand. I guess I should have been paying more attention during the sprint planning. I really need to have a conversation with Angela about this. That is my main impediment right now. I sent her an email, but haven't received a response yet. I don't have anything new to add today. I'm almost through with setting up our project on the freeware tool that I downloaded yesterday. I'll show you guys a demo in the meeting I set up later today. I'll try to chase down some of these parking lot items. Anything else before we close the meeting? All right, that's it for today. Have a great day. 
Do you have a moment to chat about the inline queries real quick? The purpose of a Scrum meeting is to keep the team members updated and resolve any impediments. It's an ideal way to kickstart the day on a positive note. The Scrum Master reinforces the sense of the self-managing team, facilitates communication between team members, brings the team's focus back to what's important, and supports improvement. In this session, we will be talking about Agile project management and several other things related to it. Before we begin, let's have a look at all the topics we will be covering today. First, we will see the basics of Agile project management. Then, we will check the relevance and principles of Agile project management. We will then see necessary steps to implement Agile methodology. Along with that, we shall also see different frameworks involved in the process. And finally, we shall see some companies that use Agile project management. So without any further ado, let's get started with what is Agile Project Management? Agile Project Management, as the name suggests, is a flexible approach to building a project. In Agile Project Management, the project is broken down into several stages or sprints. Agile does not work on the principle of delivering the final product at the end of the project. It works on delivering sections of a project or mini projects. The process of project management in the case of Agile is Agile based. So there won't be any central control of project manager as it was there in the traditional way of working. Before we move forth, let's have a look at the Agile development cycle. Agile methodologies consist of several small cycles or sprints. At the end of each stage, we get a mini project. There's a product backlog that explains new features, changes in the existing features, and several other improvements in the project. Then we have a sprint backlog, which has a list of tasks that are to be completed during each sprint. The sprint consists of planning, designing, execution, testing, and deployment stages. And at the end of each sprint, a mini project is delivered. With every sprint, new features are added to the product, which plays a significant role in the overall project growth. After all the sprints and early validation in the development, the final deliverable has a fewer chances of failure. Let's now have a look at some reasons why industries have started moving towards agile project management. The first reason is high product quality. When we talk about high product quality, we refer to the build of the product as per stakeholders' demands. Testing is performed at short intervals of time wherever needed to ensure high quality of the product. Then another reason is customer satisfaction. Whatever is done in the project is known by the customer. The deliveries don't take longer durations as they used to take in the case of traditional ways. The changes may be provided by the customer in the execution phase of the project. Third reason is reduced risk. Since the project is divided into sprints, so if the risk affects one sprint, it doesn't mean whole of the project will be at risk. The process of risk analysis continues to take place with all the other processes. Another significant reason for agile project management is better and faster return on investment. The project is now developed in several sprints and each sprint has its own version. Therefore, the project becomes market ready after a few sprints only. Since the projects can now be released with ease and in shorter duration, this helps the organization to stay ahead in competition with respect to other organizations which have still not moved to Agile methodology. Now we shall check the principles of Agile project management. There are 10 principles for successful Agile project management. The first principle is the satisfaction of the customer by delivering the project fast and with least number of errors. The next principle refers to decreasing the amount of time between the phase of planning and delivery. The third principle states that the team of managers and developers work together and increase the productivity of their work. The next principle states that the changes requested by the stakeholders can be taken into consideration and worked upon during the development phase as well. The fifth principle pays attention to the factor of coordination among the team members. Then the sixth principle refers to the process of monitoring and tracking the progress of the project at the end of each sprint and making amendments wherever needed. Moving on, the next principle states that there must be a feeling of trust and support towards the team to complete the project's objectives. The next principle emphasizes on face-to-face -face conversations with the development team. The face-to-face -face conversation helps in both solving problems and easy knowledge sharing. Then the ninth principle emphasizes on finding solutions and maximizing the amount of work done with simplicity. This ensures timely completion of tasks by all the team members. The last principle states that Scrum tools like Monday.com or Zoho Sprints must be used to simplify the complicated codes which further helps in saving time. We shall now see the steps in Agile Project Management. 
The goal of Agile methodology is to produce shorter development life cycles and more frequent product releases than traditional waterfall project management. So we will now check six steps in Agile project methodology. The first step in the process is project planning. Project planning includes feasibility study, development of scope, breaking the project into executable tasks or sprints, and then estimating the amount of time needed to complete those sprints. The second step is the step of roadmap creation. A roadmap is a plan of action that shows how a project shall evolve over time. A list of all the features that the final product should have is created and the steps to achieve those features are taken. The next important step is release planning. Since we are doing the project, keeping in mind the agile project methodology, the project will complete in sprints. That means there will be the release of features at the end of each cycle. And unlike the traditional waterfall model, the development cycles will be smaller. The fourth step in agile project management is sprint planning. The sprints are made keeping in mind what all is to be accomplished in that particular step. At the beginning of each sprint, the goal of that sprint is decided and steps to achieve that goal are taken. The next step in the process emphasizes on daily meetings. There are short meetings every day to discuss if the team was able to finish the task for each sprint and check if there are any amendments that are required. Each team member talks about what they achieved in the last sprint and what are they going to work on in the next sprint. The last step is the step of sprint review and retrospective. There are two meetings after each sprint. First meeting is for the sprint review. This meeting is with the stakeholders to show them the finished product. This helps both sides to build a relationship and discuss if there are any issues in the end product. The second meeting is for having a sprint retrospective. This meeting involves the stakeholders to discuss what went well and what went wrong during the sprint. Sprint retrospective takes place after the sprint review and before the next sprint planning. Now when we know the steps needed for agile project methodology, we must understand some agile project management frameworks. There are several frameworks available today. Here we will be discussing some of the most popular frameworks. The first framework we will discuss is the Kanban framework. Kanban framework is a well-known framework for implementing agile software development. In the case of Kanban framework, work items are represented on the Kanban board, which helps all the team members to see the state of every piece of work at any time. Kanban board not only helps in visualizing the work, but also optimizing the workflow among the team. The next framework we will discuss today is the Scrum framework. Scrum framework is a popular framework for managing complex knowledge work like in the field of research and advanced technologies. Scrum is a simple framework that helps team work together and learn through their experiences gained while working on a problem. The third framework we will see today is the hybrid framework. The hybrid framework is a combination of agile methodology and non-agile methodology. In the case of a hybrid framework, planning is done using the traditional way of project management while the execution and delivery is done using the Agile methodology. Since the hybrid is a combination of the two, it handles the requirement changes and delivers the product in different stages. The fourth and the last framework we will see is the Lean framework. The Lean framework works on the principle of providing maximum customer value and creating zero waste. It focuses on optimizing the flow of products all through the value stream. This helps in eliminating waste all through the process and create processes that requires less human efforts. This also simplifies the process of information management and makes it more accurate. Finally, let's have a look at some companies that have opted for agile project management. Today, around 22% of the organizations worldwide have all their teams working on the principle of agile project methodology. Let's have a look at some of the most prominent companies in the world that use agile project management. In the list, we have IBM, Cisco, AT&T, Microsoft, Philips, and Samsung. So as part of this tutorial, we are going to look at what are user stories, advantages of user stories, investing in user stories, how to write user stories, three C's of user stories, life cycle of user stories, then user story map and its advantages. Now let us look at a typical scenario of an organization where the need of user stories would come in. So looking at this scenario, so an organization would have a scenario where uh, the existing products are sold very well in the market and uh, they may think about introducing new product or they may think about introducing a new feature or functionality to the existing product. 
So the scenario what we are considering is it says our previous product sold really well in the market. Now let's think about new products. So we'll need to make sure we can understand the requirements and fulfill the requirements. Now how do you do this? So how are you going to understand the consumer requirements, user requirements and how is that going to help the user to accomplish the requirement and fulfill the need whatever it's required to be fulfilled. So user story helps. One who understand the user stories would look at the perspective of the users and these user stories provides those insight towards what user would exist. So as we go through we will understand in the perspective of the users, the requirements and how user stories helps in terms of fulfilling those requirements. This requires a certain amount of visualization. Let us see what it is. So what are user stories? User stories are an agile software development project management tool that provides users with simple natural language explanations of one or more features written from the end user's perspectives. So for a given product, we may have many end users. So we may develop an application within an organization and use that application for an organization. That is one scenario. Second scenario is we create a product, we sell it and employees of our customer organization will become users of those products. These are the two scenarios. So having these scenarios, what kind of product it is, what is the objective of this product which is going to fulfill. So let me assume an HR application which is used for submission of claims from the employees. So what is that requirement? So this application should accept the claims submission from the employees of the organization and then that needs to be processed and the claims needs to be uh, clear. Now what will happen now? The user community if you visualize there is an user as an employee of an organization who submit claims. So there is an user in the finance perspective who is going to deposit the money. Similarly there is an user who is going to approve. So many such user interfaces, we will see the existence of the roles of users. We will see who would be using these particular applications. So in their perspective, there should be an interface provided. There should be some privileges provided through which they would do their transactions and activities. When we write the user stories, we don't write them in detail. So a user story doesn't go in detail. It just mentions how a certain type of work will bring value to end user. So what is this role specific end user would be doing at that particular role in this particular product? What is the transactions involved? So the end user in this case could mean external end user or even internal customer or colleagues within the organization. So looking at these points, if I look at the same application, HR claim processing application, who are these internal users? The employees of organization. So who are these external Maybe the people who sold this particular application to our organization. So they have installed it. They manage it. There is an administration role for this particular product. That is a role. Similarly, uh, another set of uh, internal users, maybe someone who is like from finance, from HR. So in each of these roles perspective, this particular product should provide the interface and then there should be a transaction in their perspective, which is very important. So user story should explain this in very brief so that it helps in terms of visualizing what kind of interface has to be provided and why would this particular role use it. That is very important. So user stories also form the building block of agile frameworks like epics and initiatives. So what is this epics? What is this initiatives? Let us look at it. Now epics refers to the group of user stories where the large amount of work broken down into user stories. So many user stories together forms epics, which will provide certain insight towards how these user stories are connected with each other. So similarly, initiative refers to combination of multiple epics forming that initiatives. So which is very essential to group. So managing perspective, it will become easy. And also looking at the objective, what is that particular group of user stories, group of epics are going to accomplish. So user stories can also help ensuring that team work to goals of the organization through epics and initiatives. It should be looking at that objective exactly what is the directions we are getting into and how these combination of user stories. So as an employee, I'm submitting my claims. So what is that required in that user's perspective? There should be a story. 
So I, as a finance person, I'm going to clear these claims. I'm going to pay the money, deposit the money. So that is need, that particular role needs certain interfaces. And that visualization requires how this interactions happens. So user story should help in terms of understanding those. So the requirements for making user story a reality are added later after discussing with the team. So I, we made a user story, we created a user story. It doesn't end there. So there needs to be a discussion which happens further to decide, yes, it is a valid user story. So this will also help in terms of prioritization, which needs to be taken up first. So user stories are recorded on post-it notes or an index card or a project management software. And this would help in terms of prioritization or for tracking as well. So what is the advantages of user stories? So advantages of user story involves, it helps in delivering high quality content because what is required to be accomplished in the user perspective, that will be very clear. Eases collaboration with team members because finalization on the user stories and understanding of the user requirements would happen after discussing with the team members. Each one would give their own uh, viewpoints and uh, prioritization of particular user story or keeping a specific user story or not considering that user story would be based on the feedback which team provides. This cannot happen in terms of uh, having team members together and speaking about it. Helps understanding users better. So user roles are discussed, users requirement is discussed and what is that go they are going to accomplish through this user uh, interface that is also discussed. So user role is understood, user requirement is clearly understood by writing a user story. This will also help in improving transparency because since the collaboration is happening, since the user story is not just taken just like that, the discussion happens and that will have an inter interaction and collaboration. So it definitely improves transparency. So now it reduces risks. So when I say risk, it's obviously uncertainty. So it reduces risk because the clarity one would have about the requirement of users. So accordingly, the features functionality of the product are defined so that they can fulfill those user requirements. Then supports iterative developments. As I mentioned earlier, the collaboration, the transparency, everyone working together. And in the agile perspective, user stories, epics and initiatives gets into the specific iterations only after this discussion with the team members and after prioritizing it. So the user story will be there in the product backlogs, which will be prioritized based on that particular scenario of requirement in agile scenario. So as a, when we say agile, it's quite obvious. We need to be flexible to the changing scenarios. So since we're working together and when we go for an iterative mode of uh, approach, it is quite obvious we're going for it to get adopting to the changing scenario so that we can select that particular features functionality by pulling that particular epic or user story as a priority in the given list. So that prioritization making will also become easier. Focuses on OCL communications means lot of interactions happens while discussing on user stories. So since people are doing it OCLI, so there is some personal touch also established, could collaboration can get established. So user story also provides that visibility because of that people working together in a collaborative manner. Invest in user stories. So what is invest? So investing in user stories. So what does that mean? So it is a concept that helps creating meaningful user stories. So it, it stands for independent, negotiable, valuable, esteemable, sized appropriately, testable. So when I say independent, so whenever we write the user story, that should be self-contained, if at all possible, to avoid dependencies on other user stories. So it should be independent of one another so that each of them can be developed and delivered separately. So negotiable, so when we say negotiable, user stories can always be changed or rewritten. So at any given point in time, so we should be able to do that modifications required. So that should support the flexibility associated with the agile methodologies. So since requirements often evolve, changes, and these changes comes for various different reasons. So how do we change these user stories or modify this so that it can fit into the requirement, so that adaption can happen to the changing requirements. So stories should be discussable 
and should be open for negotiation for any change scenarios. So next, valuable. When I say valuable, it is quite obvious. We are speaking about value, what is being created for the users or consumers. So a user story would represent the goal or an objective, an end user who is going to look for. Means value is always in the consumer's perspective. So now I created certain features, functionality is fine, but did that really create the value to the consumers? So the value realization plays an important role. So stories must ensure there is a value being added to the consumers and customers or users always. Otherwise, user story doesn't make any sense. So estimable. So when we say estimable, one should always be able to estimate the size of the user story. So sometimes developers may not have the experience required to size the particular situations or needed for a user story. Reasons may be anything. It may be not having specific insight towards it or don't know how to estimate. There may be someone specific who needs to understand that scenarios and then come and discuss. Reasons may be anything. So stories, if you cannot estimate, then it will become difficult in terms of handling it better. So it should give some visualization. So it should be estimable and can be divided into tasks. So now small means sized appropriately. So user story should not be very big or should not be too small. And then uh, how do we decide on this size? So now when we say uh, any user story that can be completed by a developer in single iterations, then uh, can we call it as too big? Quite obviously that is again indicative. So user story should be subdivided into two or more small stories into multiple pieces, multiple stories, small, small stories so that it can be handled better. So story should not be too big and should be completed within 40 hours or 3 to 4 days. These numbers are indicative. So not necessarily you should be fixing with this number. So just an indicative to show you that what would be the focus when I say user story in what is that effort it would take to accomplish that. Now testable. So when we say user story is testable, one has to ensure that development is complete and has been done correctly. So means one, once you create a user story, so that needs to be articulated in such a way so that it becomes measurable. When I say testable, obviously there should be metrics, a target metrics which can be created, which will help me to state, yes, this particular requirement is accomplished. So they should have an acceptance criteria that can be tested to check if they fulfill the customer's need. So then how to write user story? This is very important uh, point to look at. So how to write the user story? So writing user stories comes up with a specific template with a simple language. So what is it? So now as a role, I want to so that, so you keep filling it. So typically role means what? The specific user role who would be using that particular product and their requirements which are being fulfilled. So that is the role, the name of the role, we are going to put it here. So the role refers to an individual that would be interfacing or interacting with the system. Now, uh, want to, when we say want to, the want or action which represents the behavior of the systems. So what is that it's supposed to do? This action would be unique to each user stories. Now, so that this refers to the benefits or results that non-functional and external to the system. As a result, what would happen? What is that we are trying to accomplish out of it? So let us look at an example. How does it look like? As a CEO, I want to track my subordinates progress to ensure organization's goals are met. Similarly, if we take the reference to those examples what we discussed earlier, like we took the example of HR portal, so claim processing requirement. Now this can be the same user story as an employee of an organization, what can I write? So as an employee of this organization, I want to submit my claims online so that claim processing will become smoother, easier, faster without any errors. So that can also be a user story. So it gives certain visualization. What kind of users are there and what is that they need? So the moment you write the user stories, you should visualize that role. It is very important. So there is three C's of user stories, which we uh, call it as card, then uh, conversation and then confirmation. So when we say card, card provides a written description of the user story. So what do I mean by written description of the user story? So same thing, the user story what we just saw as an example. So that can be written on a card. 
so this will help in planning and estimating so what and that will also gives that visualization of users and their requirement so that that can be articulated further and also estimated so that it can uh, looked in the perspective of invest what is invest what we discussed so it is independent it is negotiable it is valuable it is estimable it is sized appropriately means it's not it should not be too big too small the examples what we saw was appropriate and testable so now when we see this particular user story is it fulfilling all those points what we discussed in invest that is very important now this card whatever the description is provided should elaborate on that very clearly so then further what happens conversation after the user story is written in a card and given and it is shared with uh, every individuals who is participating in that conversation so then there will be discussion so conversation represents discussion between users team product owners so this helps in terms of whatever the user story is written is it making sense is it in line with the user's expectation and at the same time whatever the understanding we have maybe as a product owner or the team member a developer is my understanding correct the user perspective so whatever the user story is written is that user story is speaking about the requirement which needs to be fulfilled as they require so this helps to build a shared understanding between all those individuals so that there is no confusion further so once people converse together once the stakeholders converse together then you will confirm confirmation so this represents the condition that need to be satisfied to ensure that the story meets all requirements so you are confirming so all the stakeholders are agreeing to that so firstly to summarize this three c's refers to card conversation confirmation card provides the user stories which actually represents as we took an examples which will capture that so that it also fulfills the thought of invest then uh, conversation is required to understand what is this user story is speaking about is that a real requirement so confirmation further in terms of confirmation from users as well as all the stakeholders before you go on develop or execute that so what is life cycle of user story so when we say life cycle so we may require to understand a life cycle starts when you conceptualize when you visualize when you say this is what we may require to accomplish so there should be conceiving someone should conceive that idea so it may be a, related to a problem it may be related to a specific product uh, for an opportunity what is seen so whatsoever the reason it is there is a scenario where something is conceived trigger may be a problem trigger may be some uh, issues what is being faced trigger may be an opportunity what is seen so then the initiative the trigger which actually push towards creation of the requirements and user stories so the life cycle of user story starts from there so how does it go so it involves right from the point pending to to do then discussion then developing confirming and then finished so when i say pending i'm basically saying user stories in their most basic forms where they are created after communicating with the user and the project team these acts as the reminder for further discussion so first level of understanding on user stories in the basic form so which will help in terms of further discussion and taking a call on that so will there be a possibility that this user stories will be modified as we progress answer is yes and no both so it may be modified but discussion is further which goes on uh, from this basic understanding of that particular user story so further discussion is to elaborate on that make sense out of it and confirm so then after discussion with the stakeholders users stories that need to be addressed are decided and put into sprints so in between the point where we said pending to to do so in between this there is a lot of discussion so where decision is happening here so decided and put into sprints means there is a prioritization also which is happening so now discussion at this stage user confirms users confirms the requirement and acceptance criteria so acceptance criteria helps in terms of once you test that particular user story after executing you will check based on these acceptance criteria so that you can conclude the requirement is fulfilled 
the end users are shown a preview of upcoming features so that they understand yes this is what we were expecting they can provide their feedbacks necessary feedbacks or insights whatever is required to be provided so then once the discussion is complete the team would be able to design and implement features to fulfill user requirements so once user concludes yes this is what we were expecting and there is a sign off during the discussion then features are developed and implemented so that it can go to that product which can be used so then after developing confirming so the end user confirms the user story features are confirmed to testing environments alpha versions and acceptance criteria are looked at before saying yes it is confirmed user is accepting so that will happen as part of confirming means that features or functionality what was written in user story so that specific users are using it and concluding or acknowledging yes this is fulfilling our requirement and this is according to the acceptance criteria what we discussed and agreed so that is very important so we write a user story fine but users are not agreeing to it that is not a good scenario to be with user should accept and confirm then finished so the user story is completed at this stage for new requirements or new features a new user story must be created any new features or new functionality i am required to add to this particular product then i would write another user story and the same life cycle starts continues and this is not an ending thing so as i keep modifying the features as i add new features add a, uh, as i look at uh, improving the performances so i keep writing the user stories now one question keeps coming to me so we write a user story while fulfilling the requirements fine as a specific user i want this easy to narrate that so how are we going to look at a scenario where there is an improvement of something so whenever we are going to discuss about improvement of something it is quite obvious we need to look at it what is that improvement user is looking at now when i am uh, submitting a particular uh, request or accessing something it is taking some time means there is some delay now user experience can be enhanced by reducing that particular time that is improvement as a user the user story basic user story doesn't change but in the performance perspective you may require to visualize that so problem statement has to come in accordingly user story has to be articulated then once the user story is written it is required to put the user story mapping so user story mapping represents and arranges user stories that help with understanding the system's functionalities the system's backlog planning releases and providing value to the customers so typically this involves arranging or organizing user stories based on the priority along the horizontal axis so i will horizontally when you move so i will say which one is the priority which user stories are priority first thing which i need to focus on so vertical arrangements represents how in a given specific user story how the activities perspective task perspective sub task perspective further down how it gets elaborated to improving the levels how it goes forward so now let us look at uh, an user story mapping with an example of let me say net banking uh, services provided by a bank for account holders when i say net banking service it is quite obvious uh, it is also has to be provided through having a product uh, which banking application would use so but here we need to visualize the user's journey while accessing the net banking portal viewing the account details paying bills like utility bills doing a lot of transactions within that uh, particular portal net banking access the moment they do like generating statements or uh, transferring money to one of the beneficiaries etc so the, all these transactions so what is being done so in this user story map let us see how does it look like so few activities are considered here like uh, logging into the account means net banking portal will come in then one would input their credentials and then they log in now that journey of the users in a specific activity what they do is visualized now log into account in the sense obviously one has to go to that portal so go to login page then enter credentials login id and password so once that login id and password is entered obviously there is a process engine which runs behind to provide the necessary access now if that credentials are not uh, working or if i don't remember it reset password is an option immediately 
Now, as I go through further from this subtask in all the uh, particular uh, columns which I have given here, as you go through this, as I deep dive into it further, it goes on. So, until the person gets an access to the account and then start doing the transactions, it goes up to that level. So, I can keep writing the subtask further. So, manage account. So, you would go to account page once you access it. Then you'll select a specific account because you may have many different account types which is there with the bank. You may be having one or many. So in the scenario, you have more than one, obviously, you will select that account and account details will be displayed to you. So this user will not do, but user will get that. So we are visualizing that. And further after account details are uh, displayed, what user would do? Then further you would keep visualizing that. So some of the transaction like generating statement, transferring money, so even for that, the steps are written. So going to statement page, then selecting the account for which you need a statement, then selecting the period from uh, when to when the statement one is requiring, and then uh, further clicking on it and downloading that particular statement, or choosing an options, mentioning that uh, I need this in an email, or I need an hard copy of this. So similarly, transferring money, so you will go to that specific page where you need to transfer the money. So you may have the beneficiary there in the list already added. If you have added earlier or newly you are adding a beneficiary. So there are various types of transfers like so international transfer you will have, local domestic transfer you will have within a bank, uh, accounts being within the same bank. Bank A to consumers. So from me, if I am a consumer transferring money to another consumer of the same bank and vice versa. So that is one of the options. Second is a, a bank consumer having and transferring a money to some other bank account of someone else. That is another scenario or uh, transferring money for my own account in another bank. So various different scenarios you come across. So then limitation or depending on what kind of uh, beneficiaries are these, what is the limitations and how are you going to authenticate them. So the moment I visualize a specific transaction and activities of user stories, what are the things an user can do? Then I can keep writing, mapping this to each of those uh, flow and see how the flow happens. So this flow helps me to bring in all those features and functionality and also prioritizing them. So can I say the beneficiary option would be the basic thing which a consumer would give. I think initially if I go back when actually net banking features were provided by the bank, the basic thing was just viewing the account that was the given statement download was given. Otherwise, uh, there was no opportunity to transfer money. There was no opportunity to do something beyond that. So now as we see today, the lot of flexibility has brought in with lot of new features, functionalities in that net banking or mobile banking options. So they evolve. So as they evolve, it is quite obvious. We may require to keep adding those features functionality by writing the user stories. This is how the enhancement happens. So overall, if you look at user story mapping helps in terms of understanding not just the user story of one transaction, associated transaction in the user story what happens throughout the journey that would help so this will also support to understand uh, and visualize what needs to be created to ultimately give that access to the user so the end-to-end -end flow should be visualized and also needs to be prioritization and has to be looked at as well now what are the advantages of user story mapping so the advantages wise helps with prioritizing work as I explained in an example Similarly, the focus is on user value. The moment I click on web page www.abcbank.com, now the bank page will come. I will have an interface of login. I will go and click on login. Now, from the point I open a browser and input that URL and then click on login, and login page comes in. How long it takes? So, there are many things which is involved. The browser things are involved. The system from which the person is accessing is involved. So, removing that part. So, thinking that both of them are working well and what should be the response from the server where this particular website is hosted. That experience needs to be looked at. So that's how you look at user value in that transaction. Now once I put a credentials, now how quickly the authentication happens? What are the checks the bank portal does to ensure that the person who is logging in is, is a genuine user? Is it just a password? Is there any CAPTCHA codes? Is there any OTP sent? Or is there any secret code the person has to put in? So likewise, many things are involved while giving that experience to the user. So and today's user, if you just put in various different checks points, they understand because they are very educated. 
So why all those things like CAPTCHA or OTP scenarios came in? So these are came in because more and more informed the people has become, then their ability to hack also improved. So more and more levels added to ensure that only that genuine user will enter the user account. Similarly, when you visualize any product and user journey in the user's interest, what are the things which is going to create value that needs to be understood. So only that experience will help for the user to realize the benefit. Then roadblocks are highlighted. So as we visualize this journey, so this will tell me, so what would stop me to move forward? Is there any concerns? Is there any constraints? Like for example, if you want to activate a beneficiary, but for some limited period, you can only send the limited amount of money. Why is that done? By chance, if the beneficiary is added by that individual who is not a genuine user, so we are actually holding it. Right. So by the time that freezing time, whatever is given. So by the time the message goes to the actual consumer telling that there is a user activated like this. And if at all, if it is not a genuine user, obviously the person can call to the bank saying that this is not the uh, beneficiary which I have added. There is something which is not correct. So they are giving that space. So how did they visualize this has to be done? So as we looked at the journey of adding a beneficiary, it's quite obvious. When beneficiary is added, if by chance someone who is not authorized adds it. So who is going to disbenefit? Obviously user will be disbenefited. So that blocks, that constraints are visualized. Similarly in making or creating that features functionality, what should be the basic features or in the product should be ready. Only then I can add this feature. Even that will be visible. Right. So roadblocks will be highlighted and that those will be made visible so that easy for you to move forward prioritizing and ensuring that it goes in the flow required to accomplish that value. So then ensuring team unity because everyone will have a visualization, user stories and mapping reads a lot of discussion brings the people to have a common understanding. So obviously that unity, the collaboration would come in. Focus on constant improvement. So improvement is the key whatever you do. You, you have just adopted a waterfall methodology, you have just adopted an agile, you write user stories, you write epics, you write bring in that uh, various different methods to do something, whatever you do, whether there is a product or a service or a process or a specific uh, uh, transactions, task, reports, whatever we make. So all that should help in terms of identifying the opportunities for improvement and making that improvements. That is very important. Today, as all of us know, Agile has become a well-known development methodology and the approach of choice for many development teams, especially those trying to create an environment of continuous delivery. When we think of Agile, we often think of high levels of collaboration and flexibility as well as iterative environment in which requirements evolve alongside the changing needs. So as a result, we also tend to conceptualize Agile as an approach that helps development teams across various industries deliver new features faster. But how do we get there? What does history of Agile entail? And how can knowing the history of Agile help us better understand the methodology and its positive impact on today's development world? Let us look at it. So now, historically, if you see, the waterfall approach was fine. It was delivering the required value, but it required teams to stick to the requirements and scope of work set out at the very beginning of the project and not make any changes or additions along the way as the project progresses. And following that fixed plan could prove trouble sometimes. Comparing to the scenarios which we had earlier versus today, the trouble is more, challenges more. So reason being waterfall methodology prioritized bringing a complete product to market, meaning it could take years before teams finish the project in hand. The scenarios of change, delay in responding to problem resolution, meeting changing market requirements were challenging, which led to introduction of agile methodologies. So the various development methods like Scrum, Rapid Application Development, Extreme Programming, DSDM, Feature Driven Development and Pragmatic Program were introduced. So it all started early, I think in 2001 it was introduced. 
However, it all started in the spring of 2000 when a group of 17 software developers in Oregon to discuss how they could speed up development in order to bring new software to market faster. So they recognized two key opportunities that achieving this goal would make possible. So reducing the time to the benefits for those users in order to resolve the product market fit and development problems. Secondly, getting feedback from users quickly to confirm the usefulness of new software and continue to improve on it accordingly. So further, this group of 17 developers met again at a ski resort in Snowbird, Utah, US. So they created popularly known as Agile Manifesto, so which laid out four key values. So which says individuals and interactions or processes and tools, working software over comprehensive documentation, customer collaboration over contract negotiation, responding to change over following the plan are valued more. Now, further, between the time when it was introduced till today, Agile has become popular and adoption of that has increased, reason being the flexibility the Agile brought into the system. So several organizations across the world started using it. But what happened further? So Agile gave the result, but there was a challenge. So there were some issues that Agile faced to handle widespread usage. That is mainly whenever there is a scalability requirement. So what is that scalability challenge? It is quite obvious. How can an implementation of Agile for large and more complex project and how hard the process to scale Agile? So this was not clear. The very reason, the challenge which come across, which the practitioners actually faced was, one is lack of experience with Agile methodologies, little understanding of frameworks, methods and how to implement them. Next, large scale coordination. So when I say specific project, a small project, it was easy implementation of Agile and then going forward all the frameworks what i mentioned earlier it was easy but the moment you want to do a scaling to the bigger organization the complex environment the coordination collaboration dependency management between usually uh, distributed teams geographically distributed teams was challenging and thirdly having a clear understanding of what needs to be completed in the sprints and what the bigger picture is so fourth aligning the entire organization and managing commitments. So definitely organization required a alignment. The products or services which are being produced by the project needs an alignment. So the need of alignment was basically to ensure the organization gets the value out of whatever they have invested. So fifth, unrealistic expectation with respect to speed of delivery. So unable to respond to this particular scenario so that organization can able to respond quickly. So it was not happening. So time to benefits I, I was mentioning about. So generally earlier we used to speak about time to market, but today it has been replaced by time to benefits. How quickly the value of that particular product or services introduced to the market is realized by the users. That is very important. So the framework of a scaling Agile, there are various different frameworks. So some of the most effective ways to scale Agile uh, uh, would be large scale Scrum, which is called as LS, Scaled Agile Framework, Disciplined Agile, Scrum at Scale, Nexus Scrum, the Spotify model. So when I say LS, the large scale Scrum, it is a way of scaling Agile and scaling Scrum to large and big product development groups. It has been used since 2005 in different software and hardware products in industries such as banking and telecom. So when it comes to scaled agile framework, so it is a set of organizations and workflow patterns intended to guide enterprise in scaling lean and agile practices. So it is uh, made freely available by scaled agile Inc., which retains the copyrights and registered trademarks. So the Disciplined Agile Delivery, which is also called as DAD, is a software development portion of the Disciplined Agile Toolkit. So DAD enables teams to make simplified process decisions around incremental and iterative solution delivery. So DAD builds on many practices by uh, 
advocates of agile software development including scrum agile modeling lean software development and others so scrum at scale so scrum originally if you look at outline in the scrum guide is a framework for developing delivering and sustaining complex products by a single team so since its inception its usage was extended to the creation of products processes services and systems that require the efforts of multiple teams whereas scrum at scale was created to efficiently coordinate this new ecosystem of teams it achieves this goal through setting up a minimum viable bureaucracy via scale free architecture now coming to next one the nexus scrum so this consists of multiple cross functional scrum team working together to deliver a potentially releasable integrated uh, increment at least by the end of each print based on dependencies the teams may self organize and select the most appropriate members to do specific work so lastly the spotify model which is basically people driven autonomous framework for scaling agile while emphasizing the importance of culture and network this methodology uses squads tribes chapters guilds the foundation of which is squad which acts like scrum team so further let us look at the our focus area of this particular video which is basically what is scaled agile framework so scaled agile framework as i mentioned earlier consists of collection of principles best practices and processes that would enable large organizations to adopt agile methodologies so it would help them deliver products and services of the highest quality faster so safe is best suited for complex projects that involves several large teams at the projects program and portfolio levels the current version of safe is version 5 which has seven core competencies based on which it can help organizations the large organization in specific so safe has certain core values which are basically alignment built in quality transparency and program execution so when i say alignment so i was mentioning about aligning with business uh, requirement business strategies so it is needed to keep pace with fast changing disruptive competitive forces and geographically distributed teams while empowered agile teams are good even great but the responsibility for strategy and alignment cannot rest with the combined opinions of the teams no matter how good they are instead alignment must rely on enterprises business objective so it also need to require to keep up with the change the competitions and then the dynamics across in the environment where organization is doing their business so next is built in quality so built in quality is basically to ensure that every element and every increment of the solutions reflect quality standards throughout the development life cycle so quality is not added later building quality is prerequisite of lean and flow without it the organization will likely operate with large batches of unverified unvalidated work which leads to the product or services which is not okay and also that would lead towards excessive rework which is not good and slower velocities which is not allow the organization to respond quickly to the dynamics of the market so third one is transparency so transparency which basically need to enable teams to rely on each other there should be trust which needs to be built so based on which high performance can happen so wherever the trust exists so when the business and development can confidently rely on each other to act with integrity particularly in times of responding quickly or to work out a solution for resolving something which is actually not allowing things to move forward so without trust no one can build high performance teams and programs so the confidence needed to make reasonable commitments is very very essential so fourth is program execution so safe focuses on working systems and business outcomes which mainly for example for teams to execute and continuously deliver value safe places an intense focus on working systems and business outcomes 
So this is because while many enterprises start the transformation with individual agile teams, they often become frustrated uh, as even those uh, teams struggle to deliver more substantial amount of solution value, reliability and efficiently. So delivering solutions with better value, reliability and efficiency, effectiveness is very, very essential. And here we are speaking about ensuring the scalability to the bigger organization. So program management plays a very important role. So that requires a lot of communication, collaboration. So without a better execution of that, without handling it better, things cannot go the way it is required. So various competencies, SAFE recommends. So SAFE competencies involves team and technical agility, agile product delivery, enterprises solution delivery, lean portfolio management, organizational agility, continuous learning culture, and then lean agile leadership. So when I say team and technical agility, so agile teams are high performing and cross-functional. Business solutions are built by business and technical teams, delighting customers with high quality output. So this requires an able team which understand agile frameworks, which follows it, which complies with it, and also technically sound. So agile product delivery, which actually refers to the scenario where the customer is at the center of organization's product strategy. So development is based on cadence and releases on demand, exploring integrity, deploying and innovating continuously, then enterprise solution delivery. So building big system with the help of lean, coordinating and aligning the entire supply chain, evolving the live system continuously requires to ensure the visibility of entire enterprises and providing solution accordingly. Lean portfolio management, which basically focuses on aligning the strategy, funding and execution, optimizing operations across the portfolio, decentralized decision making powered by lightweight governance, then organizational agility. A lean agile mindset is created across the enterprise. It is very essential. For example, I am working in a project. I have an attrition. If HR does not understand my project dynamics and if they are not agile, me as a project organization becoming agile will not help. Similarly, the one, the procurement, similarly, the processes. So very essential for all the organization units to become agile so that business operations are able to complement, contribute that speed or the change what is required. So opportunities and threats are addressed quickly. So risks are identified and addressed quickly. So they are worked on it. So risk management can become easier with the involvement of right stakeholders. Continuous learning culture. So in this scenario, everyone learns and grows together. Exploration and creativity are a very important part of organization where there should be an innovation, creation, execution. Maybe I think uh, I come across certain terms like intelligent risk taking. So learning through failures. Failure should lead towards inquiry, not towards blaming. So this, these are all the things which are more and more discussed when we want to make an organization a learning organization. The continuous improvement of solutions, services and processes is everyone's responsibility. Then lean agile leadership. So by modeling desired behaviors, inspiring others, aligning words, actions and mindset to lean agile principles and values, lead, change and guide others. So this requires a lot of accountability and ensuring the correct information, well-informed individuals to take forward things. Now, how does SAFE work? So SAFE, considering those competencies, what we looked at, the seven competencies. So let us see what happens in each of the competencies. How does SAFE work using these competencies? So firstly, let us look at team and technical agility, which uh, basically uh, involves an agile team of five to 11 members which helps defining, build, test and deploy products. So this is done by dividing the task into small, easier to manage time boxed iterations. Right. Then uh, Scrum team led by the Scrum master and supported by product owner plan and then deliver the product in increments. So further after delivery, they have a retrospective to determine how the iterations went and how it can be improved. 
this is incorporated into next iterations planning phase. So the method used here could be Scrum or Kanban. So both are popular. The combination of this can be used. So Scrum basically helps in ensuring that things move in iterations and everything is visible and delivered. Whereas Kanban supports in terms of making it more visible and able to manage it better. So Agile product delivery. So a large organization usually consists of several Agile teams each led by their respective scrum masters. So these teams together represent agile release trains also called as art. So they usually involve 50 to 125 people. So art are cross-functional and involve everyone who understand customer needs and can help with building and delivering the solution required. So art uses an agile delivery practices like the one used by the teams to deliver value to the customers. So it uses time boxed iterations called program increments or PIs, which usually involves four to five iterations. All the teams, they get together to plan their work during PI planning events. So they should work together. They should have full visibility while doing it. So three major components which are required when we do agile product delivery is release train engineer, then project management, and then system architect. So release train engineer represents the coach of the art facilitated the PI planning process. The project management provides the vision for the project and backlog of the tasks. System architect provides architectural guidance for the process. And then uh, the teams then make plans regarding what they would be able to deliver. So the program board is also drawn up to determine dependencies between the teams, which also goes through program iterations, the PIs, as I mentioned earlier. Then after every iterations, the art shows the integrated output to all teams through a system demo. So after the PI is complete, all team get together to retrospect event called the inspect and adapt events. So further, a continuous delivery pipeline is set up based on the art. DevOps practices are also used to ensure values available on demand. I think the term DevOps is becoming more and more popular today, which actually providing that visibility, need for collaboration, need for cultural transformation. So which helps in terms of bringing that agility across the organization as well as learning organization. So one of the principles of DevOps itself says continuous learning. There should be continuous experimentation and learning risk taking, intelligence risk taking, and also we come across speaking the concepts like Semian Army concept, like introducing failures into existing systems and learn what can fail and what is the solution for it. And that can help in terms of becoming more resilient and reliable system. So DevOps has become popular and adoption of that, discussion on that is uh, become more common across the organizations. So next, enterprise solution delivery. So enterprise solution delivery, let us look at a scenarios where a single art may not be able to deliver an appropriate solution. A solution train which coordinates multiple arts and suppliers would be able to provide solutions in large and complex scenarios. So meaning consideration of enterprise as a whole, seeing end-to-end -end organization, entire visibility. So basically what is that we are trying to achieve? So alignment we discussed about, which requires the objective of organization because organization is investing. So whatever we do at various different levels should complement to each other rather than contradicting. So that complementing thought or complementing visibility can happen only when someone has a bigger visibility. Enterprise world by outlook. Then uh, the three major components that are required in the enterprise solution delivery would be solution management, solutions architect, and solution train engineer. The solution management holds content authority over what needs to be built. Solution architect handles the architecture across the arts. Solution train engineer enables coaching and facilitating of solutions train events. So next is lean portfolio management. So lean portfolio management provides ways of creating and combining strategic themes and portfolio vision. This enables solution development to be aligned with enterprise strategy. 
So the moment I say lean, firstly we should keep in mind that it's about creating value to the stakeholders. That is first thing. Second thing is elimination of waste. Now when I link this to strategy, when I link to, towards the organization's directions, what it sets, and while going in the directions, I should ensure no defects are actually moved downstream or are eliminated when it goes to downstream. So customer should see the value, which is very important, and identification of all the contributions of waste has to be done and eliminated. So this ensures there is a value in organization's value stream, which also ensures that these value streams remain funded. So funding plays a very important role. So next is organizational agility. So when I say organizational agility, it should ensure the organizations, various business units in the organizations should be with that dynamics of agility which organization is going through, which organization is moving through. As I mentioned earlier, if, if you have a project where you have, you have adopted agile methodologies, it's quite obvious for your pace, for your flexibility, for your speed, other business units which are working with you to support you should also complement to that. They cannot become slower. They cannot have their own pace of uh, doing things. Like in your project, you have a procurement, you have a recruitment, you have some claims to be cleared from HR. Maybe you're dependent on certain tools and environments. Now, if these are not agile, if these are not responding in the same flexibility or same speed what the agile project team requires, then obviously things will not flow further. Now, when I say agile, obviously we introduce products or services quickly to the environment. Now, someone needs to manage. We have operations. Now, can operations manage the products or services which they are not aware of? Now, even there the agility is required. As I keep introducing the new products or services to the environment, operations should also be well informed and educated about it so that they can monitor and manage them effectively and efficiently. If they fail, I think users will not have a good experience. Your product or services may have a great features functionalities. But however, if whenever there is a query about that product features or functionality, whenever there is an issue, the incident which user actually calls, the first point of contact for any users would be the operations. The moment operations fails to respond with the right clarifications or right resolution quickly, then obviously user experience will result in not a good way. I think customer satisfaction or customer delight will be at stake. So an operation should become a so rest of the business units which are supporting, like funding we spoke about. If funding is not done in an agile way, obviously the things cannot move smoother or easier. So everything across organization should become agile. Organizational agility has to be ensured. So enabling portfolio with strategic agility, making change in the direction depending on the scenario, then encouraging the growth of lean thinking people and agile teams. So people should be working towards ensuring creating value always. Every task, every transaction is what they do, should be enabled through it. So they should also know whatever we are doing, how this particular task or the work or the results, what I am creating results in value addition or value creation to the organization. Does it really align to the organization's requirement? Is it fulfilling? Maybe customer as a stakeholder or my own organization, the business unit, which is actually investing on this project. So in that context or in that perspective, everyone should be aware of that alignment, the directions, the vision. Then uh, focusing on value and helping with organizing and reorganizing, building an environment for the flow of value across the organization. So everyone should realize value. So value is what? Value can be uh, defined in the perspective of every individual's background and every individual's requirement because it's a perceived one. So there may be real thing what we have created, but perception is different. So the perceived versus what is actually created should be as closer as possible. So zero deviation is expectation, but difficult. But however, it should have a tendency towards it. It should actually be very near to that perceived reality. But Two things involved. One is that I create a features and functionality for my product or services which fulfills customer requirements. Customer may not know, not well educated, not aware of it and don't know how to realize that value. How to know how these features and functionalities can be used. So now if you educate that customer, the user, how to use it, what are the values it can create and 
do some uh, exercise in terms of educating, training, coaching, customer can visualize and understand that. That is one possibility. Second thing is customer is very matured and our product does not have features and functionality required. So these are the two scenarios which require a lot of interactions and engagement so that increasing in terms of usage of product and services and realizing those values. So this has to be encouraged more and more. So further continuous learning culture. So when we say learning, it's quite obvious. Organization should keep maturing. Individuals in organization should keep maturing in terms of capabilities, in terms of ability to do new things, innovate, the knowledge, the capabilities, skills, competencies. So that can be possible only through learning. So learning should be continuous. So this ensures an atmosphere of innovation and constant improvement until organizations becomes a learning organization. So meaning at every level, each individuals, each professionals, each engineers, each executives invest their time in learning. They learn through what they are doing. They go through formal training. They bring in that formal training, learning into the actions here. For there, they, they learn. So continuous experimentation, creating an hypothesis, working on those hypotheses, aligning that to the requirement of organization and seeing how is it complementing to the organization's requirement. So seeing through these are very essential. So the organization which is having the culture of continuous learning can sustain and grow continually. There is no question of looking back. If organization has a scenario of not learning, they will fade away. They may fail to exist. So it is very much required to understand the market dynamics, continuous learning there. Capabilities and skill enhancement, continuous learning here. Innovations and making things better, continuous learning. So continuous learning helps organization to be there in the industry and continue with the competition. So next is lean agile leadership. So it's quite obvious leadership plays very important role. It's about guiding, it's about owning, it's about showing directions, it's about ensuring everyone does the task, everybody is motivated. So the leaders must embody, teach and exhibit lean and agile principles and values. So firstly, they should understand what it is. They should be aware of it. They should have an exposure to it. They should have full awareness of it. As I was learning about continuous learning culture in the previous point, so leaders should do that first. So only then I think the followers will actually have learning adopted to themselves and things move smoother and better. And this should happen across the organization. So by doing this, it is quite obvious, organization can become better agile. Organization is complemented to achieve the objectives and goals what they wanted to accomplish. And uh, there is a safe configurations which one needs to ensure, which involves essential safe, raj solution safe, portfolio safe and full safe. So when I say essential safe, it acts as the foundation for all safe configurations and is the easiest starting point for implementation. So large solution safe, it is used for building large and complex solutions, whereas portfolio safe provides principles and strategies that can enable business agility in an enterprise. So when I say portfolio, it should be understood as a portfolio of an organization as a whole the service portfolio, the product portfolio, the business portfolio. So understanding of that and complementing to that is very essential. So full safe is a comprehensive configuration that includes all competencies and ensures business agility. So advantages and disadvantages of safe. So advantages involves enabling decentralized decision making. It eases collaboration across cross-functional teams. It ensures decisions are made with strategic objectives in mind. So disadvantages include additional layers of oversight which makes it resemble the waterfall approach. The top-down approach can limit understanding of the software life cycle and cause bad planning. So visibility, providing that visibility is very essential. Then larger planning cycles and roles that are fixed in development cycles. In this session, we will be learning about the two most popular software development lifecycle models. We will be understanding the contrast between the Agile model 
and the waterfall model or software development. So without any further ado, let's get started. Now, before having a look at the differences in the two models, it is important to understand the basics of software development life cycle and the need for it. As the name suggests, software development life cycle is a process that is used in any software industry to design, develop and test a software. The goal of the life cycle is to meet the quality standards of a software. A software is always made keeping in mind the customer expectations, time deadlines and cost estimations. The framework is a collection of steps in which different tasks are defined and performed at every step. Let's have a look at all the steps involved in the process of software development. Software development life cycle has six different stages. The first stage is planning and requirement analysis. It is the most important and fundamental stage. In this step, the inputs are taken from everyone involved in the process. This information is then used to plan the basic project approach and to conduct product feasibility study. This helps the project to excel in the economical, operational and technical areas. Then comes the second step that is the defining phase or the requirement defining phase. Once the analysis of requirements is done, this step involves defining them and getting them approved by the customer. This is made possible through a document called an SRS or Software Requirement Specification Document. This consists of all the product requirements to be designed and developed during the project life cycle. After the defining phase comes the designing phase. The SRS that was made in the last step is now used as a reference to construct the project. On the basis of the SRS, a design document specification or DDS is documented which helps in deciding the designing approach of the project. The next step is the building or development. As the name suggests, the actual development starts in this step. The code for the software is generated as per the DDS documented in the previous stage. For the code, the programming language is chosen with respect to the type of software being developed. After the development, the step of testing the product comes into the picture. This stage refers to the stage where the product defects are reported, tracked, fixed and retested. This is done until the product reaches the quality standards defined in the SRS. The last phase is the deployment phase. After the testing is done, and the product is ready to be deployed, it is formally released in the market. The product may first be released in a limited segment and tested in the real business environment. Then based on the feedback, the product may be released as it is or with some upgradations in the market. Now, when we know the steps of the software development life cycle, let's have a look at the SDLC models. There are several software development lifecycle models defined and designed which are followed during the software development process. These models may be referred to as software development process models. Every model has its own set of unique steps to attain success. There are several SDLC models in the market. Here we will be discussing the two most popular models, the waterfall model and the agile model. So let's begin with what is waterfall methodology. The waterfall model or the waterfall methodology was the first process model to be introduced. It is a linear sequential life cycle model that is easy to understand and operate. In the waterfall model, each phase must be completed before the next phase has to begin. The next phase entirely depends on the output or deliverables of the previous phase. The entire process of software development is divided into a sequence of several phases. All the phases can be seen as a waterfall. Flowing steadily downwards, no phase overlaps the other phase and begins once the previous phase is complete. The steps involved begin with gathering of requirements and go up to the phase of maintenance. Let's have a look at all the phases in detail. The first phase is the requirement gathering phase. 
as the name implies all the possible requirements of the project to be developed are gathered in this phase and documented in a requirement specification document then comes the system design phase the requirements gathered in the previous phase are studied in this phase and the system design is prepared the design helps in specifying all the requirements and also helps in defining the overall system architecture after the design phase comes the implementation phase after the inputs in the system design phase the system is developed in small programs called units these units are integrated in the upcoming phase here in this phase each unit is developed and tested for its functionality which is referred to as unit testing now comes the integration and testing phase all the units developed in the previous phase are now integrated into a system post integration the entire system is tested for any faults or failures after the testing phase comes the deployment phase once the entire testing is completed the functional testing and the non functional testing the product is deployed in the customer environment or released into the market now comes the last phase that is the maintenance phase the issues that come up in the client environment are fixed in this phase then to enhance the project some better versions are released maintenance is done to deliver these changes in the customer environment all these steps or phases are strictly followed one after the other like a waterfall moving forth we know about the waterfall model and its phases so let's now see what is the agile methodology the agile methodology believes that every project is different and needs to be handled differently and the existing methods need to be tailored to best suit the project requirements the agile methodology promotes continuous iteration of development and testing all through the software development life cycle the process looks forward to quick delivery of all the functional components involved in the project in agile the tasks are divided into small time frames to deliver specific features for a release these divisions are known as sprints and these sprints have their own set of deliverables which are decided at the beginning of each sprint the work can be reviewed by the project team and the customer with the help of daily builds and sprint demos demo working software is considered to be the best means of communication with the customers to understand the requirements and not just depending on documentation one of the major focuses of the agile methodology is on the customer so the process involves the customer throughout the project as the requirements cannot be gathered completely in the beginning of the project due to various factors continuous customer interaction is very important to get proper product requirements then there are several phases involved in the agile software development life cycle beginning with the building of concepts and going up to the retirement process the life cycle consists of five different phases let's have a look at all these phases in detail the first stage of the agile life cycle is the initiation phase the initiation phase or the inception phase is about the finalization of project scope and the return on investment in this step the team members that will be needed for the project are identified then time constraint and other resources required to complete the project are also taken into consideration the second stage in the life cycle is the planning phase in this phase the team gets together and identifies exactly what they are looking for they make a firm plan of how to make the project a success in this phase the risks are estimated and the milestones are developed with an initial release plan after the planning phase comes the development phase once the requirements have been defined based on the feedback from the product owners and stakeholders the actual work of development begins agile product development delivers high quality working products in incremental phases or sprints then comes the release phase the product after being developed is now deployed and starts getting used by the end users the stages now 
are closely monitored for any errors, defects or bugs that might have been left in the testing part. This phase continues until the project is fixed with all the bugs and is ready to be retired. The last and the final stage is the retirement phase. This last phase marks the deployment of a newer version of the product in which all the bugs are fixed. There may be some minor changes of software in the newer version and the older version is no longer supported. The product may also be retired if it is not cost effective in the present business scenario. Now when we know the basics of the two SDLC models and their life cycle phases, we shall differentiate between the waterfall model and agile model depending on different aspects in software development. The first aspect we will see here is the life cycle. In the case of agile methodology, the life cycle of the model is in a continuous iterative format. This helps in developing and testing a project in several iterations. Whereas in the case of waterfall methodology, the life cycle is in a linear sequential format where the development steps are followed in the form of a top-down approach. The second difference we will see is on the basis of rigidity. As we know, agile model is a very flexible way of building a software in which the feedback of changes may be accepted even after the development has begun. Whereas the waterfall model is least flexible and the structure of the model is rigidly followed while developing a software. The second difference we will see is on the basis of rigidity. As we know, agile model is a very flexible way of building a software in which the feedback or changes may be accepted even after the development has begun. Whereas the waterfall model is least flexible and the structure of the model is rigidly followed while developing a software. Then the next aspect we shall discuss is collaboration. If we talk about the collaborative nature of the model, then agile model is very collaborative in nature, which enables it to deliver a better output and complete the project in a more productive manner. Whereas the waterfall model is not open for collaborations. It does not allow the team to collaborate and strictly follows the sequence of steps. The next important aspect is the process. In the case of agile method, the process is divided into sprints that have their own deadlines and deliverables at the end. The waterfall model has a process of software development that is broken down into several phases that go as a top-down approach giving a deliverable at the end. Now after the process, the aspect we will consider is accepting changes. In the case of agile methodology, the changes can be accepted after the initial planning is complete. Whereas in the case of waterfall model, the development requirements cannot be changed once the project development has begun. The next important aspect in our list is software development. If we consider the agile model, the process of software development is a collection of many different projects as the agile approach completes the project in several sprints. Whereas in the case of waterfall model, software development is completed as a single project or deliverable. The next aspect we will discuss is testing. In the case of agile methodology, testing is performed in the same step in which programming or building of the software is being performed. Whereas in the waterfall model, there is a separate testing phase in which the system is tested and this phase comes after the build phase. We often come across the question, which development model to choose for software development. These contrast, especially these last three will help you understand which model will be a better fit for your work. The next aspect we will see is focus. That means what the agile or waterfall model exactly focuses on. So agile model focuses on customer satisfaction and performs the steps with their respective inputs, making the entire process to be customer centric. Whereas the waterfall model strictly focuses on the steps in the process and rigidly follows the sequence. It just focuses on completing the project 
at the end of the sequential process. Whereas the waterfall model strictly focuses on the steps in the process and rigidly follows the sequence. It just focuses on completing the project or software at the end of the sequential process. Now, the next important factor is the projects. That states which of the two models is a better fit for what kind of projects. If we talk about the agile process, it is well suited for projects in which the requirements may change. Whereas, if we consider the waterfall process, it is well suited for well-defined projects in which all the requirements are well stated and no changes are expected. The last crucial contrasting factor is the customer satisfaction. As we know, Agile model is customer centric and hence involves the customer at every step of the process, takes their input and implements them. Whereas the waterfall model is an internal process that does not involve the customers and just strictly follows the sequence of steps. Let's talk about what Agile is. Agile is a very popular principle that is used in software or project management. The approach involves creating products in an incremental manner from the start of the project rather than delivering all of it at once at the end of the project. Agile processes focus on frequent inspection and adoption, on encouraging teamwork, self-organization, accountability, and delivering high-quality software. The business approach is to align development with the needs of the customer and that of the organization. Now, like I mentioned earlier, the Agile process delivers work in small, usable increments. For organizations to take advantage of Agile principles, they need to adhere to the values that are mentioned in the Agile manifesto. Agile puts individuals and interactions over process and tools. Working products are more important than comprehensive documentation. Customer collaboration is much more important than contract negotiation and responding to changes holds more significance over following a plan. With Agile, the clients and the project team can have large amounts of interaction. This helps them understand each other better. Clients have greater transparency to every phase of the project. The output is delivered in a predictable manner and sometimes can happen sooner than expected. It provides high quality development, testing and collaboration due to the project being broken down into smaller units. And thanks to continuous evaluation of requirements, plans and results, teams can respond to change really fast. Now, let's talk about some agile methodologies. Let's have a look at each of them. First off, XP. Extreme Programming or XP is a framework with which teams can create high quality software. It can also greatly help improve their quality of life. It also involves the appropriate engineering practices to enable software development. Now it is applicable for teams handling changing requirements while working with smaller teams handling risks due to new technologies, and much more. Next up, we have Kanban. Kanban is a visual system that can help organizations visualize their workflow, to design, manage, and to improve the flow of the systems. Now, it's applicable in scenarios where the work is unpredictable. It is also used for deploying work quickly, without having to wait for the other components. Next up, we have Lean. Lean provides a set of tools and services that focuses on identifying and removing waste so that the speed of the process development can be improved. With Lean, waste is minimized and value to the customer is maximized. The principles of Lean can be applied to any sector which is liable to produce waste. Then we have Scrum. So we'll be taking a look at Scrum in a little bit, but basically Scrum is a framework that involves teams establishing a hypothesis, then trying it out, reflecting on their experience and making corresponding adjustments. And finally, 
we have Crystal. Crystal is a software development approach that puts people and interactions over tools and processes. With Crystal, processes are streamlined and optimization is improved. Crystal is applicable in scenarios where the focus is on the team communication being strengthened. Now, let's have a look at what Scrum is. Scrum is a framework through which teams can work together with the help of sprints. Sprints are events that are time boxed and are usually of two to four weeks length. Scrum enables teams to learn from their experiences, self organize and work on their problems, reflect on their successes and losses for improvement. The team's progress is measured with the help of a 15 minute long daily meeting called Daily Scrum. During this meeting, team members talk about what they plan to do on that day what they did the previous day, and what roadblocks they were facing. With Scrum, teams can deliver their projects in an efficient manner. Time and money are used effectively. Thanks to Scrum meetings, visibility is improved, and improvements can be made thanks to constant feedback from clients and customers, and so much more. Now, let's have a look at how Scrum works. So here's the entire process. Let's have a look at each component. Firstly, we have product backlog. First, a list of all the tasks that need to be completed is created. Now this list is called the product backlog. Now completion of all these tasks represent the successful completion of the project. Next, we have sprint planning. Here, the team decides the different tasks that they're going to work on and focus on delivering them during the upcoming sprint. Then we have sprint backlog. Now the tasks that were discussed in the product backlog are then added to the sprint backlog, which is basically just another smaller list, which consists of selected items from the product backlog. Next up, we have the scrum team. The scrum team is a collection of five to nine people who are working on the tasks mentioned in the sprint backlog. Then we have the daily scrum. Now this is a 15 minute long session during which team members can synchronize their activities and determine what they did the previous day, what they plan to do on that day and what roadblocks they were facing. Next up, sprint review. Now after a sprint is complete, a meeting involving the scrum team, scrum master, product owner and stakeholders take place. During this meeting, the team shows off what they accomplished during the sprint. Questions are asked, observations are made, feedback and suggestions are also provided. Now, back to the product backlog. Now, the product backlog is presented to the stakeholders so that the product owner can get some feedback for upcoming sprints. Then, there's also the sprint retrospective. Now, during this meeting, previous mistakes are identified and new ways to handle them are determined. The data that's obtained from this meeting is also used while planning the new sprint. And finally, we have increment. Now, in this stage, a workable output is provided to the stakeholders. And after this, another sprint starts and the whole process is repeated again. Now, Let's talk about Scrum versus Agile. Firstly, let's have a look at methodologies. Now, Agile is a set of principles that are iterative and incremental. Agile has a number of different methodologies you can choose from. There's XP, Crystal, Kanban, even Scrum for that matter. Let's talk about Scrum now. Scrum is an implementation of the concepts of Agile. So basically, most of the important components of Agile can be applied to Scrum as well. It provides the customer with incremental builds that are delivered to the customer in the span of two to four weeks. An organization can be agile, but not practice Scrum. However, an organization cannot practice Scrum without being agile. Next up, let's have a look at projects. Agile is more suited towards projects 
that have a small development team that consists of experts. Whereas on the side of Scrum, it's usually better suited for projects that are subject to a large amount of change and that too rapidly. Next, we have leadership. Now for Agile, a project head takes care of all the tasks and has a very important role to play in the process of Agile. A project head represents the entire team and is responsible for getting issues resolved by assigning them to the appropriate members of the team. In Scrum, there's no leader. There's a Scrum master who can overall guide the Scrum process, but the team addresses issues by themselves. It usually involves cross-functional and self-organizing teams. Next up, we have flexibility. Agile is relatively more rigid than Scrum and cannot handle changes with ease. It also requires a lot of upfront development process and changes within the organization. With Scrum, you can enable team delivery. Agile requires frequent deliveries so that they can get feedback from the end user. This in turn will help make the product better. The product is delivered as well as updated on a regular basis. With Scrum, after a sprint, feedback from the client for a build is provided to the team. Scrum involves daily Scrum meetings to review and get feedback to determine the next steps of the project. The next sprint is only planned by the team after the current sprint is complete. Next, we have collaboration. With Agile, collaboration involves face-to-face -face interactions with team members of other cross-functional teams. For Scrum, daily stand-up meetings take place with specific roles like Scrum Master, Product Owner, and the Scrum Team. And finally, we have design. With Agile, the design, as well as its execution, it's relatively simple. With Scrum, the design and its execution can be innovative and experimental. So you might be wondering, which one should you choose? Now, among both these options, there's one thing that will remain common, Agile. Now, what you can decide upon is which Agile methodology you'll be choosing. Is it Lean, is it Kanban, or is it Scrum? Let's jump into Scrum versus Kanban. So before we dive into the differences between Scrum and Kanban, let's have a look at what exactly Scrum is. Scrum is a simple Agile project management framework that is used by organizations to help teams collaborate, handle unpredictability, and complex projects or products while ensuring the products delivered are of the highest value. It describes a set of meetings, tools, and roles that enable teams to work in sync and help them structure themselves and manage their work. Scrum is one of those things that's really easy to understand but very difficult to master. And although Scrum is seen to be used generally by software development teams, its principles and themes are pretty universal and can be used with just about all kinds of teamwork. With Scrum, teams are able to learn from their experiences, what worked out, what didn't, and things like that. They're also able to organize themselves to handle their problems effectively and basically improve themselves by reflecting on them. So how does Scrum work? Here we have the first component the product backlog. The product backlog consists of a list of tasks that need to be completed so that the goals of the stakeholders are achieved. Then the team decides what tasks from the product backlog they want to take up and deliver in a two to four week period called sprint, hence the name sprint planning. Next, the tasks that were discussed in the previous phase are added to the sprint backlog. This is a set of tasks which will be focused on in the ongoing sprint. Following this, the scrum team, which is usually 5 to 9 members strong, will work on these tasks. Now, they also have regular scrum meetings where they talk about their victories, the issues they face, and what they plan to do in the next 24 hours. And then they have the sprint review. 
The sprint review is a meeting during which the team shows what they accomplished during the sprint. Now, during this time, questions are asked, observations, feedback, and suggestions are made. The product owner also gets feedback for upcoming sprints from stakeholders. They also have a sprint retrospective. Now, during this session, past mistakes, potential issues, and new ways to handle them are identified. Data from here is incorporated into the new sprint plan. The final step is increment. Here, a workable and usable output is provided to the stakeholders. So now that we know how Scrum works, let's have a look at Kanban. Kanban comes from the Japanese word Kanban, which literally means signboard. Like Scrum, Kanban is a popular agile framework that is a visual system by which the work can be managed with ease as it progresses. Kanban uses something known as the Kanban board to make these things possible. With this, you can easily identify bottlenecks and then fix them cost-effectively at optimal speeds. The main focus with Kanban is transparency. Since everything related to the tasks are on the board, everyone can keep themselves updated. It also ensures the teams focus on their current tasks until they're done. This limits the amount of work that's in progress. So on the Kanban board, work is divided into smaller, more manageable pieces. The work that's needed to be done is written on a note or card and placed on a board. Columns on the board help represent where each item is with respect to the workflow. Now let's have a look at what these are in detail. Let's find out how Kanban works. Now the board consists of three major components. There's the to-do list, which represents items that need to be completed. The ongoing column, which represents items that are being currently worked on. And the completed or the done column. Now these represent tasks or items that have already been completed. Now although this is a physical representation of the board, several organizations use software versions of the board that replaces the sticky notes with cards that can be moved from one column to another as work progresses. At this point, you guys must have realized how similar these two frameworks sound. So let's run through some more of their similarities. Let's find out how they are similar. Firstly, they both have principles of lean and agile, which means reduction of waste, and both of them are time-boxed and iterative approaches that enable product delivery in an incremental manner. Both these frameworks aim to reduce the amount of work in progress. This forces the teams to ensure that they focus on a smaller set of tasks. This also makes blockers and bottlenecks a little more visible. In both cases, the work is divided into smaller, more manageable units. Both of these frameworks use pull scheduling. Now this means the products are only built based on demand rather than forecasts. Transparency plays a major role in both these frameworks by helping them drive process improvement. And in both cases, the release plan is continuously optimized. And finally, both these methods aim to deliver releasable software often and earlier than expected. Now, let's have a look at how these two frameworks are different from one another. Firstly, let's have a look at cadence. Cadence refers to the amount of time in a sprint or before a release. So when it comes to Scrum, the entire project is divided into time-constrained iterations, that is, into smaller, manageable units. But when it comes to Kanban, it's event-driven. The next criteria we're going to have a look at is release methodology. In Scrum, releases take place after each sprint, which usually takes two to four weeks to complete. 
for Kanban, releases take place in the form of continuous delivery. They happen in such a way that changes like new features, configuration changes, bug fixes and experiments get to the users in a safe, quick and sustainable manner. Next up, let's have a look at how changes are addressed in both these frameworks. In Scrum, no change can be made while the sprint is in progress. Once it's complete, changes can be considered in the sprint plan and then added to the sprint backlog. With Kanban, changes can be made at any time and incorporated into the workflow. Now, let's consider the metric that's being measured. In Scrum, for planning and process improvement, velocity, which is the measure of the work that can be completed by a team in a sprint, is the key metric. In Kanban, lead time is the key metric. This represents the period of time between a new task's appearance in your workflow and its final departure from the system. Next, let's have a look at how teams work in these frameworks. In Scrum, you need a cross-functional team to achieve your goals in a sprint. In Kanban, cross-functional teams are optional, but specialized teams that focus on particular aspects of the workflow are required. Now, let's talk about new additions. In Scrum, just like handling changes, you can't add any items between a sprint or an iteration. In Kanban, new items can be added to the board as long as there is capacity available for it. Now, let's have a look at the job roles within these frameworks. Scrum has three major job roles, Product Owner, Scrum Master and Scrum Team. With Kanban, you don't have any specific job roles. Now, let's talk about representation. Or moreover, let's talk about how data can be represented. With Scrum, the board needs to be reset once a particular sprint is complete. With Kanban, the board stays persistent throughout the entirety of the project. And finally, let's have a look at project length. With Scrum, it's better suited for longer projects. And with Kanban, projects that can be completed in a shorter period of time are better. So which one should you choose? Now, selecting from these two methods is mainly based on the requirements of the team. Do you expect your project to be shorter? Do you want to make changes at any time? You don't want to set up job-specific roles? Then Kanban is the framework for you. Or do you want a long-running project with different job roles and involving cross-functional teams? Scrum is the answer for you. Based on the differences we discussed in the last topic, you can make an informed decision. Now, let's have a look at some of the popular companies around the world that employ both these frameworks. Some of the companies that have successfully implemented Scrum are Facebook, General Electronics and Adobe. Companies that have implemented Kanban are Siemens, BBC and SAP. Today, we will learn how to become a certified Scrum Master. So without further ado, let's get started. So here we have two people. Let's call them Jim and Pam. Here, we see Jim introducing himself to Pam and the team as their new Scrum Master. Pam is now expressing interest in becoming a Scrum Master herself and is asking for some guidance from Jim. Happy to help, Jim starts. First, let's talk about Scrum. What exactly is it? Scrum is an extremely popular agile framework which enables teams to work together while working on a complex project or a product. Scrum helps teams to self-organize, to learn from their experiences and to reflect on their victories and losses for improvement. Although commonly used in software development, the concept of Scrum can be applied to any kind of team. It's basically a collection of meetings, tools, and roles that help the team structure and manage their work. Let's talk about some advantages of Scrum. First of all, it improves the quality of product development. 
With Scrum, you are able to develop complex products in less complicated process. Teams are able to constantly make improvements to their product thanks to the input and feedback from their customers. Next, it provides faster delivery of projects. Now, this can be an extension of previous point thanks to the real-time updates from stakeholders or end users. The team is able to immediately address the changes. This enables the project to be delivered at a faster pace. Then, Scrum gives you a high return on investment or ROI. Scrum enables you to deliver projects with decreased time to market thanks to the results being delivered early. It gives stakeholders to further reinvest. It also proves the worthiness of the project to the stakeholders who are interested. Next, Scrum enables self-sufficiency and creativity. It enables team members to be creative with problem solving and to take a hands-on approach to the project. And since decisions are taken by each member of the team, they make sure of their own self-sufficiency. And finally, it improves customer satisfaction thanks to the constant involvement with each phase of the project with feedback and interactions the final product is more likely to be in a form that they'll appreciate next let's talk about the role of a scrum master a scrum master is an individual who promotes and supports the usage of scrum practices in the team and the organization scrum masters have a high level view of the project and help team members perform their tasks better without having to deal with obstacles and distractions. A Scrum Master helps the team understand the theory, rules and values of Scrum. Considering there are many moving parts in a project, the Scrum Master enables the business, the product owner, the Scrum team and other individuals to work together in harmony. Now, let us talk about the responsibilities of a Scrum Master. A Scrum Master ensures that the product owner and development team follow Scrum values, principles and practices. This can help teamwork effectively and provide high quality results. The Scrum Master also ensures the team's productivity isn't affected by any blockades. If the problem can be solved by the team members on their own, the Scrum Master helps. The Scrum Master accesses different blockets and prioritizes solving each one of them. The Scrum Master also protects the team from any distraction and any external interference to make sure that they are able to deliver value at the end of each and every sprint. A Scrum Master ensures that the team isn't involved in any irrelevant discussions and focuses on the sprint's requirements. The Scrum Master also has different roles to play with specific components of the Scrum process like the product owner, the Scrum team and the organization. Now, let's have a look on the Scrum Master's responsibilities to the product owner. The Scrum Master makes sure the goals, scope, and product domain are understood by everyone in the team. The Scrum Master needs to find a way to effectively manage the product backlog. This helps the Scrum team understand why their product backlog needs to be clear and concise. The Scrum Master needs to ensure the product backlog is arranged properly and to facilitate Scrum events like sprint retrospectives, sprint planning, sessions, daily Scrum events. Now, let's have a look at how a Scrum Master is responsible to the Scrum team to develop the team to self-organize and to enable cross-functionality with teams to help the team create products of high value to remove roadblocks that the team may encounter. The Scrum team needs to facilitate Scrum events like they are required. Now, moving ahead, the Scrum Master helps the organization to lead and coach its adoption for Scrum. The Scrum Master helps to plan the implementation of Scrum. The Scrum Master needs to help the employees as well as stakeholders. The Scrum Master helps to understand how Scrum helps to increase the value produced. And finally, the Scrum Master helps to make changes that increase the Scrum team's productivity and more.
Now, let's talk about how can you become a Scrum Master. First, you need to have a strong understanding of Scrum and Agile concepts. As a Scrum Master, you need to ensure that your team follows the principles of Agile and Scrum. You need to have a clear understanding of different teams and phases within Scrum to ensure you can understand and teach the usage of framework to the organization properly. In short, having a detailed understanding of the systems and terminologies is mandatory. A Scrum certification can also greatly help with this. More on that in a little bit. You need fine-tuned organizational skills. You need to be able to structure the team and plan out their actions to ensure everything stays organized. And to make sure everything stays on track, you need the ability to plan things out. You should be able to ensure that the team stays on schedule and all the tasks are completed successfully. You could also use online project management systems like Monday.com, Nutcash and Sam9000 to keep things organized. You need to be familiar with the technology the team uses. You need to ensure that the team is able to complete their project in a timely manner. This can be done if you have an understanding of different technical terms and processes that the team is involved with. Hence, some technical familiarity and training is really important. You also need to have the ability to coach and teach the team to follow Scrum properly. For teams that are new to the Scrum methodology, your ability to teach them the different concepts, terms and principles play a very important role in the future success of the team. You need to be able to tell the team not only what it needs to be done, but also how and why. You also need to be able to encourage the team members to work together and improve themselves. You may also need to work with individual team members to maximize their potential. You need to have the ability to handle conflicts and resolve them quickly. Considering how teams are filled with people with different personalities, ideas and working styles, it is only likely that they may clash with each other every now and then. If disagreement cannot be handled among themselves, you need to be able to figure things out. If left unsolved, this could inhibit the entire team's progress. So you must be able to negotiate and resolve the conflict in a way that satisfies everyone. And finally, you must be a servant leader. A servant leader puts the needs of the team before their own and helps each member to perform the best of their capabilities. You need to be both a leader and the team member. You need to be the part of your team while making sure they can successfully fulfill their requirements. Now, let's talk about certifications. To become a Scrum Master at a certified one at that, one of the most important things you can do is to get through the certified Scrum Master test. This test tests your understanding of different principles and processes that are the part of Scrum process. Moreover, to take this test, you need to have completed an in-person or an online course taught by a certified Scrum trainer or certified Agile coach. You'll also need to have at least 14 hours of face-to-face -face interaction with the aforementioned trainer or a coach. Let's get to the exam. The exam is of 1 hour and it has 50 questions in it and you need to score at least 37 to pass the exam. The exam costs around 29 to 30 dollars and you have 2 attempts to clear. After 90 days or 2 attempts, you'll need to pay 25 dollars to write the exam again. Once you are certified, you'll need to recertify yourself by taking an exam again after 2 years. Now, let's talk about the salary of a Scrum Master. According to Glassdoor, the United States of America, a Scrum Master earns approximately 97,000 US dollars per annum. Meanwhile, in India, a Scrum Master can earn up to 14 lakh rupees per annum. Hyped up about becoming a Scrum Master yet? Let me now tell you about how Simply Learn can help. 
Simply Learn offers the certified Scrum Master Certification training course. So in Simply Learn Certified Scrum Master Certification, we will be providing you with Scrum and Agile methodologies, importance of Agile, Scrum life cycle, Scrum terminologies, roles involved in Scrum and much more. So take your first step to getting certified and getting ahead in your career by clicking on the top right corner and enrolling with Simply Learn. And with that, we have come to the end of this full course video on Agile and Scrum. I hope it was informative and interesting. If you have any questions related to the topics covered in this video, please ask away in the comment section below. Our team will help you solve your queries at the earliest. Thanks for watching, stay safe and keep learning. Hi there, if you like this video, subscribe to the Simply Learn YouTube channel and click here to watch similar videos. To nerd up and get certified, click here.